Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everybody. I'm so delighted that you're here, that you're having a chance to chat with each other. But I'd like to start the meeting, if I may. And on behalf of the planning committee, Dr. Susan Felton, Chris Lehman, and Gabriella Wilson, and our two amazing conference coordinators, Jutinga Knox and Catherine Flaherty. I would like to welcome all of you to our second annual Texas Health Informatics Alliance Conference. This event is hosted in partnership with the University of Texas at Arlington, the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, and the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. We are so excited, truly, to welcome every one of you here in person to our campus. You'll recall the last one was online. And we have a very exciting program arrangement for, arranged for you today. All in, all of you here. The theme of our conference this year is all in, artificial intelligence and machine learning to accelerate health. Indeed, all in artificial intelligence and machine learning to accelerate us towards a true healthcare system. That is the theme that you will be discussing and having fun with today. We're going to look to the future as we all try to expedite the move from our current sick care system into a true healthcare system. To fully actualize this vision, we now have exquisite analytic tools we've, that we've never had before, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning at our fingertips. Throughout the day, you will hear from speakers who will share examples of how enabling technology tools can be put into the hands of our caregivers, our researchers, and educators in actual practice and extend their current abilities. Therefore, theory into practice, we have arrived. Before I turn the program over to my colleague and co-director of our center, Dr. Gabriella Wilson, we will introduce our opening, who will introduce our uh, keynote speaker. I would like to thank everyone for attending our conference today, our sponsors, and all speakers for bringing their expertise to this event. Last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous support that we've received from the University of Texas at Arlington, College of Nursing and Health Innovation, and UNT Health Sciences Center for providing continuing education credits for healthcare professionals. Please feel free and know that there's a sign up available for all of you outside. All of you here today have the vision, the knowledge, and the experience to help us pave our way to a better healthcare system. You are indeed our most significant assets today and tomorrow, and we could not accomplish any of this without your support. Throughout this alliance, I ask you to stay engaged, keep us proactive, and help us shape the future of healthcare, healthcare informatics. Thank you so much for attending today. And at this time, I would like to wish you a pleasant and enjoyable conference and pass the baton to, our, uh, to, you, to Dr. Wilson. Oh, I have the distinct pleasure, actually, to introduce our president, who will add her welcome to me this morning. Thank you so much. President Cowley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, y'all. It's great to see you here on the campus of the University of Texas at Arlington. I wish I could hang out with y'all all day. This is like the coolest topic ever, I think. I mean, I assume that's why you're here, because you want to learn cool things. Um, I just think about how much our healthcare uh, system has been transformed, and we are just at the cusp of what's to come. 
I've had the chance to tour some of our laboratories on campus and see the incredible work that is happening in the artificial intelligence and machine learning space, the way that we will really be able to get to individualized healthcare, um, as I'm sure you've heard, move to a wellness system rather than a sick care system. And I'm really excited that the University of Texas at Arlington gets to be part of that transformation. So I look forward to the great conversations that you're gonna be having today, the things that you're gonna be learning from our great speakers that we have that are presenting today, and hope that you have a fantastic time at the University of Texas at Arlington, which is a phenomenal Texas Tier 1, R1 university that has amazing teaching and research going on. So I wish you all the best in your conference today. Thank you. Thank you, President Kali. We are very excited to be all here, all in, and Dr. Marian Ball for welcoming everyone this morning. Uh, our keynote speaker starts at nine o'clock, right? So you all excited about that, I hope, right? Okay, so let's get started. Um, I just wanna make a few remarks that when we were planning this conference, we thought, who should we bring here from Texas who are all well known for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and embracing technology in clinical practice, as well as using technology in the community. So our keynote speakers are a treat for all of us today. We are really honored to have them. And it, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Dr. Brian Vartabidian. I met Dr. Vartabidian, believe it or not, in 2016 when I was organizing a health informatics conference in Indiana. And we are three, three states coming together, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana. And Dr. Vartabidian caught my attention at that time because he was one of the most active social media people, doctors, in that space. And I said, this guy looks interesting. So I started tweeting him about coming to the conference and I got no replies through email, but I got lots of replies from him through Twitter. And I said, that's it, he is a social media person. So now we're using LinkedIn. Um, but um, I was fascinated not only by that, but the fact that he was doing so much work on patient education and intrigued by the fact that he was also known as the public physician ready to provide professional wisdom for life in a connected, always on world. How cool is that? Let me share with you why Brian Vartabidian is known as the public physician. Dr. Vartabidian is the chief pediatrics officer of Texas Children's Hospital in Austin bringing to the table an administrative skill set in strategic planning, inpatient ambulatory operations, outpatient surgical management, process improvement, clinical technology adoption, healthcare communications, social strategy, and physician management. He understands how hospitals are conceived and built to meet the unique needs of their communities, and this is very important. Integral in the conception, design, building, and activation of Texas Children's Hospital, The Woodlands, Dr. Vartabidian helped shape a blueprint for subspecialty care that extends beyond the boundaries of the traditional children's hospital. Calling Texas his home since 1991 and as part of the leadership team of Texas Children's $500 million expansion into Austin market, he is excited to scale the legacy and success of America's largest pediatric hospital system. Dr. Vard Bidian is passionate about communication and patient education, and he is best known for his exam room whiteboard sessions that are part of every evaluation, summarizing patient treatment plans with bullet points, arrows, and summary lists 
His novel method has been written about and adopted in clinics far beyond Texas Children's Hospital. Patients and parents routinely photograph his work of art to remember what was discussed. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Vartabidin. Thank you, Gabrielle. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to come down on the, on the floor with you all, if that's OK. Um, as a means of background, I teach at Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, some of what we're doing here this morning, hopefully I won't get feedback, is what we do with some of our Baylor College of Medicine students in terms of teaching them how to engage publicly as uh, healthcare professionals in the 21st century. And so um, uh, just in full disclosure, uh, I normally work off a program called Keynote. And in the last minutes, you saw us scrambling, and we converted this to uh, 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 PowerPoint. And so hopefully, we won't have too many glitches here. But um, everything that we talk about today, everything you hear about, uh, in terms of public communication and engagement, um, you can find uh, on my site, 33 Charts, which is my blog. You just go to the public physician. And if you're a health professional, you're a nurse, a doctor, or pharmacist, or anything, uh, it'll kind of give you some insight in terms of how to fashion your public presence. That's what we're talking about today. It's really kind of the information realm, but the public-facing information realm. Um, and so I kind of, in terms of my background, uh, I am a writer. I wrote a book called uh, Colic Solved. And uh, when I wrote that book back uh, 10, 12 years ago, everyone said, well, you have to have a blog in order to, be, to sell your book. And so I dutifully started a blog. And I said, um, this is going to be short term. And this was the early, early years of the internet. And uh, after I put it up, I realized very quickly that I had a platform to the world. Um, and maybe all, some of you guys are too young to recognize it, but those early days of the internet, it was really, really uh, eye-opening to think that we could really kind of uh, uh, you know, have this platform to, to reach people across the other side of the world. And so I started this site called uh, uh, 33 Charts. Um, and it evolved as a place for doctors to kind of learn and understand how to behave and engage in the public space. Now remember back then, um, when, when docs, you guys don't remember this, but early on, people wondered, like, can you talk to a patient who, who reaches out to you on Twitter? All those things are, are, are behind us now, but early on, no one really knew what to do, and we didn't know the limits of what we could do with a public conversation. So. Um, just a, a short history of physicians in public, and this goes for nurses as well. Um, this timeline kind of illustrates the past few years, um, and it, it's kind of broken down, as you can see from the top, in the early part in the 90s, I call communication was kind of hyper-local. Everything was kind of uh, controlled by the institution. If you were a student at UT Arlington, all the communication that happened came from the Office of Public Affairs. All of our images were, were finely tuned. When they went out to the public, they looked one way. Nurses looked one way with their caps, and docs looked one way with their white coats. Um, everything was really staged to look one way. Um, and I call this, per, it was kind of permission-based. Um, and then if we, the, the second phase began around the year 2000 when we saw the emergence of the internet. Um, I, this was the democratization of communication. This is where um, we develop the ability to create the content that other people read, whereas in the hyperlocal days, it was all generated by the media and the Office of Public Affairs. So this divide was huge. And uh, early on in 2000, uh, when health professionals were online, a lot of us were anonymous because we were afraid of what was going to happen if our institutions knew that we were creating content online. So certainly all the early physicians, Dr. Anonymous and others that, um, if those of you who were around way back when remember, they all used pseudonyms because we were afraid we were going to get in trouble for saying something. Um, and so interestingly, uh, as more and more, do more docs and nurses and health professionals came online, there was a real flurry of interest in health professionalism. Uh, there was a lot of fear and anxiety about what would happen when all these doctors start 
and nurses start going on Twitter uh, and saying things. And there are concerns about liability with the medical schools. And so I was um, uh, the head of digital professionalism for Baylor College of Medicine in 2008. It's a position that no longer exists because it was based on this fear that the college was going to be exposed to all kinds of liability from, from health professionals and medical students using Twitter. Um, and, and so that kind of went away. And what's interesting now is when we look at health professionals, nurses and doctors on social media, it's really morphed into uh, uh, issues of social justice. And we feel like we have this, a lot of docs and nurses feel like they have this obligation to be out there um, um, spreading the, the mission and, and ideas of social justice. So it's interesting to see how it's evolved over the years. Um, and so we've seen this, this movement from what's hyper-local on the left, that's the way the world was through most of medical history, um, to now um, where we're online, we're, we're exponential, we're forward-facing, we're outward-facing, we're engaging with this global community, uh, we're collaborative and we're democratized. Uh, so one of the things that I always like to say and tell people is that, and again, this I'm normally talking to medical students here, but this applies to nurses and pharmacists and everything else, but we're completely unprepared to deal with this, commun this public communication environment. We're 10 years into it, um, and we still see really serious breaches of professionalism and, and, and such. And so programs like this are really important for us to kind of talk and have a conversation. These are conversations that have to be happening here at UT uh, Arlington as well. And so the reason we're unprepared is because in our entire lives as nurses and physicians, everything has been based about in real life. Everything was the physical exam in the exam room, and we're now facing this other reality that we have this other presence. We have this online presence. And as we'll see in just a moment, whether you like it or not, you have an online presence. It's not an option at this point. So uh, certainly in uh, medical education is starting to catch up with the idea that we have this obligation that goes beyond uh, just what we do in front of patients. Um, and so this is, again, this applies to nurses as well, but this is sort of a new public responsibility. Um, and I, I like to call um, this, this idea of what we do outside of the exam room and online as my role as a public physician. And so in the blue is our in real life, uh, uh, what we do with patients, and in the red is what we do in, in public, which is increasingly growing. And this is just a list of some of the things that are new responsibilities for healthcare professionals. We have to think about uh, the ethics of the conversations we're having. Um, if we're uh, UT Arlington and we have uh, a, an education program, are we, how do we look on our Twitter account and what are we doing to provide education on public health information and things like that? And so all these things that we see listed on the left are part of a new professional responsibility. And all the doctors I talk to, they're like, oh my gosh, there's something else I have to do besides what I already have to take care of. Um, so why is, why is a strong public presence important for you as um, a nurse or a doctor or even a program developer or leader? Um, first is relevance, okay? To be relevant in the world, you have to have a public presence. This is where people look for you when they want to know something about you. They Google you and um, they're going to find you there. And of course, if you think participation is optional, of course, so is relevance, right? That's always what I like to say. And because I have medical students all the time saying, I'm just going to opt out of this, and you can't opt out of it. So relevance is the first uh, argument that we make for why a public presence is important. The second is inevitability. OK, as I already said, there's already a first page of Google all about you. And you can, we'll talk in just a moment about doing a vanity search, which is when you type your name in and see what comes up. And there's already uh, a page that happens around you. And if you don't control what is created on your own behalf, someone else is more than happy to do that for you. So you have to make a decision, what am I going to do to improve my digital footprint? Uh, and then there's opportunity. Uh, because when you are visible, uh, people will talk to you. When people talk to you, things start to happen. It's part of, the global, part of our global network. I, when I look at my colleagues, I look at them two ways. I look at the docs who are inward facing. Those are the docs that 
engage only with the people in their immediate real life space, and then outward facing, those people who engage on a national and global conversation with the network. Um, and I can, I, we could spend till noon talking about all the opportunities that happen when you are visible. As an IT professional, uh, and there are tons of those, um, as a nursing student, whatever. And then finally, there is responsibility, and this is the most provocative assertion for having a strong public presence. Um, back about 10, 12 years ago, I suggested for the first time that uh, physicians have a moral responsibility to be part of the public conversation. So I was a pediatrician um, who started on Twitter in 2008. At the time, there were very few physicians, and there was a very strong anti-vaccine voice online, and we were constantly getting, we were struggling with this anti-vaccine messaging, and uh, I, I, as a pediatrician, felt like I had this obligation to be out there having this conversation. There are thousands, tens of thousands of doctors now part of this conversation, and so um, I think that's, that's changing and evolving, and uh, we're, seeing, you know, we're seeing some real representation from health professionals. So this is just kind of fun, but I, I like to think about the developmental phases of docs, and this probably goes for nurses as well, but um, what does it take, wh what do we go through when we grow and become public physicians? Um, so, of course, early on, when we use uh, social media as high school students and junior high school students, we're kind of self-centered. It's a tool for connecting with friends and finding parties and whatnot. And Okay, so this is the, what I refer to as the jackass phase. I had to, yeah, we had to get that point in. Um, and so this is kind of a, 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 a point where we're, we're really just centered on our own things and having fun and that sort of thing. Then there is, we go to college, then we go to medical school, nursing school, then we, we see this, this threat of responsibility. We start to get concerned about risk or in college, we're gonna apply to nursing school or a master's program and so um, we go dark, and so this happens with all our Baylor College of Medicine students. They, they do the scorched earth deal where they level all their social media profiles in anticipation of applying. And then they uh, start to realize when they're looking for jobs that, or, or they're going into a competitive market that they have to have a presence to compete against uh, other docs in the year 2022. And so, um, they become enlightened, and so these are the phases that we go through, and you probably notice these with your, if you have young kids or college kids. I have a 22-year-old, and I've watched this whole thing evolve, and so it's been fun. Okay, so this is, uh, I hope you guys had your coffee, because this is sort of interactive, and um, I kind of want to hear what you guys have to say, but this is a, this is a case uh, of screaming Facebook baby, and um, a pediatric gastroenterologist, uh, gets a Facebook friend request from a lady in the community. Uh, he's unacquainted with this, this person and messages back thinking maybe this is someone he met at a party in the community or a, a soccer group or whatever. And she said, you don't know me, but I have an eight week old baby who won't stop crying and only takes 12 ounces of formula a day. So for those of you who aren't pediatricians, a baby, an eight week old is only taking 12 ounces is concerning. They should be taking 20 to 24 ounces a day at that point. And so, when this, when this message lands into your inbox, it's like, what do I do? So any ideas what this, uh, what, what this how this should be handled? Anyone, anyone feel, want to feel brave and yell out? Ask them to think of into the office. Okay, that's an idea. But the kid's in distress. Don't you want to tell them what to do? You have an, your hand up over there? Or oh, we're stretching. Any other ideas? What insurance do you have? Oh, what insurance do you have? Oh, very good. We have a, we have a joker in the audience. Okay, yes. My responsibility is send them to urgent care. Send them to urgent care. Okay, all right. Well, it's an interesting dilemma. You can see this, right? Okay, we have, a, we have another yellow. Oh, do a telehealth visit. Okay. Well, that's good. I thought that's a great idea. Uh, this was me, actually, uh, but it was long before there was telehealth, um, so th but that's a really interesting idea. So what we, what we like to uh, 
when we're teaching our students down in Houston, we always, you know, we always tell them that there's no obligation to respond for solicitation of advice in a public space. Um, I felt, and, you know, when you're, you need to have boilerplate languages because as a nurse or as a doc, people are going to find you and they're going to ask you questions. So you need to have some boilerplate language. Usually I say that my uh, Texas Children's and uh, Texas Medical Board doesn't allow me to dispense information in a patient that I don't have a relationship with or advice to. And so you got to have that figured out. And so um, this, it gets a little different. What if it's my patient? What if it is a patient that's established with me already? And this is a, a, a direct message I got on Twitter from a father of a child with ulcerative colitis who I'd started on some proctophone, which is some enema with some steroid in it. And it was actually a, a, a Roasis suppository, actually. And he, he didn't know whether we were supposed to, he was supposed to give a whole suppository or a half. So I'm at my son's baseball game, and this lands on my at message on Twitter. So, uh, this is, but this is my patient. So how, would you guys handle this any differently? He's already my patient. Okay. A patient portal. Okay, yeah. So you could suggest that they engage on the patient portal, right? Yeah. That's an idea. Um, so I'm not going to abandon them and just leave them alone, right? And so the things that we, uh, things that we think about here, and we, we, we always teach when this happens, that the first rule number one, we take the conversation offline because, you know, for health privacy and HIPAA compliance, we can't be having conversations on these, on these channels, right? Oops. And uh, you want to address the concern. A lot of these, certainly early on, were, you know, millennial moms or, or young moms who um, think this is a, a great way to communicate, to communicate with their friends. Uh, and we also want to educate them on their, uh, on how to do things in the future. And when we create a phone note, we always, uh, the healthcare attorneys always say that we should put that the patient initiated the contact and there's some argument that there's implied consent for conversation on the platform when they initiate it. Um, and you know, these things probably should be, uh, we put them on our after visit summary that the ways to reach us, there are so many communication channels now for reaching a doctor or a nurse. In the old days, you had to call the office or maybe email early on, but now there are so many ways to reach out to us. Families really need to know and have some education on the ways and the channels they're gonna use to, con to connect with us. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, another case, the case of the newly minted pediatrician. Uh, she's an AAP fellow, meaning she's now a pe full-fledged pediatrician, first year of her job. Through medical school and residency, she avoided any kind of online visibility because she was afraid that she was going to get in trouble and so on and so forth. Now she finds herself in a new raging metropolitan market and she wants to compete and she wants to know what she can do. Any, any ideas what this young lady can do? You want to shout out? Podcast. Okay, so create, start creating content. Create a podcast about per, per, parenting issues, and yeah, that's great. Get visible. Create content. We'll talk about that in a second. Any other, any other great ideas? LinkedIn account. Yeah, perfect. We'll talk about LinkedIn in just a second. That's, that's the easiest and quickest onboard, right, to having a professional presence. Uh, probably, maybe not as many parents are going to find a, a LinkedIn page as they are going to find on the podcast, but uh, yes? Oh, so ask, ask moms to, yeah. And that's, that's kind of a charge one. I think I may have a case further on about asking for, asking for uh, how we ask about getting reviews from patients and whether we should be doing that or not. Or it, it's kind of a it's kind of a loaded issue, ethical issue, whether we really should be compromising. And it's like when you go to buy the, the BMW and the guy says, are you going to give me five stars and you don't want the car go into, you know, so. Um, so what are the, yes, last one. So not even using new media, just kind of getting out there and pushing the flesh. Yeah, absolutely. This, we, we forget with all these tools that that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, healthcare relationships with midwives, nurses, doctors, 
remains face-to-face. -face. The ultimate interface is face-to-face, -face, as I like to say. Um, so how can we, how can she begin a power presence of you guys who are young um, or just kind of starting out? Um, these are the things that I like to talk about. Define your purpose, conduct an audit, find a mentor, and shape your map. So let's start with uh, defining your purpose. And your, your, you always want to think about why am I here? Why am I, why am I on Facebook? Why am I on Twitter? Why do I want to have that podcast that we heard about over there? And um, when I'm talking to docs and pediatricians, these are some of the different purposes that, that some docs may find. You know, you're a new gastroenterologist. Maybe you're launching a baby book that you've written. Uh, maybe you're an educator. Maybe you're a bile acid researcher or a chief technology officer at a hospital. All those things, there are different reasons for being online, different reasons why you may want to use an online presence. Um, and so that's kind of defining your purpose. You really want to think through that. Then you want to sort of conduct an audit. And this is, this, is, this is our vanity search, right? This is when you put in your name plus RN or MD. And you got to look at everything, the images, video, written copy. Um, what have you created versus what have other people created? And that's kind of a, a key differentiator because, again, you want to control what people see. You don't want other people to create what people see about you. Um, and what properties do you exist on? We sometimes think of these as properties because it's that serious, right? Facebook. And how do you look to searching eyes? Um, so our next deal here is find a mentor. So I always recommend that if you're a, a pharmacist or an IT professional or whatever, always look for someone who's doing exactly what you're doing and follow them and look at them. So if you want to get into Twitter, find someone who's exactly in your space and see what they do. So if you're in, in a medical education and you're the, you're the dean of a, of, a, of a school or a college, Peter Hotez, who you've probably seen on CNN, he's our dean of tropical medicine. Uh, this guy's he's crazy. He's everywhere. I mean, he has an amazing, amazing uh, social presence. His social presence drove his mainstream media presence, which is something we see happening all the time. When you're visible on... Um, on uh, Instagram, uh, dare I say TikTok, uh, the media finds you, right? Um, and so he's got really some really powerful stuff. So he's someone you can just, if you're in medical education, he's someone you can follow. And then shape your map, okay? We, we, there are two things on the internet. Did you guys know there are only two things on the internet? <laughs> Probably did. The first is uh, content, and that's, content is anything that we, and there's all this conversation, so those are the two things. So content is the stuff that we consume. It's stuff that you go on the internet for and look at. Okay, conversation is the, the transient, ephemeral stuff that you have between your friends. You chit chat and then it disappears. And so the difference here is that content is permanent. That's searchable and findable. Uh, social dialogue is findable as well, but it tends to be what we call ephemeral, meaning it it's in the stream and it just kind of floats away. Um, and so these are, I, I think this is always a great way to, to, to illustrate the importance of creating content. Um, I have a lot of friends on, medical friends on Twitter and they just say, this is where I live, this is my space. And I say, well, people can't find you there. So your footprint, uh, your footprint is what people find when they look for you, is built on content. It's all based in content. And, but it's important to understand that converse, oops, I'm sorry, um, conversation is going to draw eyes to your content. So while content is key, those conversations will pull people in. So I have my blog, 33 Charts, pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter, and that's about it. And whenever I post something, it goes to there, have conversations about it, people come to my home base. Um, and it's that page that I saw, showed you at the very beginning of the presentation. So footprint is built on content. We said that. And you've got to have content as a health professional. Um, and so there are two kinds of content that I like to think about. One is uh, profiles, or what I call public profiles, LinkedIn, Doximity, places, uh, or your hospital, uh, home, hospital homepage where you can create a bio uh, of yourself, like Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine both have bio pages that search pretty well, as you'll see in just a second, and right now, in fact. And so um, 
This is a recent search of my name, and this is what came up. And what's interesting about this is all of these are public profiles. The top one is my Texas Children's. The next one was uh, US News uh, Health, which is what the US News reports are based on. That imports from Doximity is LinkedIn. Uh, Bell College of Medicine near to the bottom, and then right at the bottom, Health Grades. So just by updating something about myself, my bio, my name, my address, things I'm interested in, that's like the very basic thing that you can do. And that very first page, all of those profiles have to be completely filled out for you if you're a health professional. Um, now, interestingly, up high there is content, and that's my, my blog, I think, on both of those. Um, yeah, and so that search is pretty high. So if you write 750 words and put it on the internet, after a few weeks, it's gonna gravitate up to the top like that. And that's what people will see. Um, so this is my friend David Hill, um, who is, I work with in the Council on Communications and Media for the American Academy of Pediatrics. And this is his, uh, this is his LinkedIn uh, landing page. Now, there are a couple things that sort of stick out there when you guys look at that. You guys have looked at LinkedIn pages before, right? What, what strikes you when you look at, anything? He's what? He's got a bow tie. Yeah, he's in North Carolina, he's a pediatrician, he wears a bow tie. Um, right, and he's got a good, good picture. That was one of my things I was looking for. Decent headshot. The message box. He's got a message box, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, but more importantly, he's got a long narrative bio there. How many of you people have written a narrative bio like this on your LinkedIn profile? Oh, there we go. We have one. No, but when I, when I look at my colleagues at, at the Bale College of Medicine, none of them. It's empty. So this is the greatest opportunity for people to understand who you are and what you do. And you can write it in first person, you can write it in third person, whatever you want to do. Um, and, and that's... so. This is what people are finding, right? And so he's got a really a great professional headshot and a great narrative bio, which I think is important. So those are two big things you want to have. Uh, now, if we move to his experience, anything strike you here with his experience? Does this look like your experience page on LinkedIn? It's what? It's like a CV. It's like a CV. What, so what he's got here, um, I don't know if I have a pointer, but he describes everything that he did. All of my colleagues, all my physician colleagues, just have a laundry list of stuff. There's no description of what they've done. So you look at this and it's just, it's very deep. It's got a lot of depth to it. It tells you exactly what, um, what he's been doing and it's a, it's a, it makes a great impression. And so, yeah, we get that experience. And uh, also, he's cursed with the name David Hill. Um, and what I mean by that is there are, like, there are like 100 David Hills online. So when you search for David Hill, Unlike me, I'm the only Brian Varbeen on the planet, um, which is good, but if you're David Hill, so everything he puts in has to have MD after, because that's how a lot of people are gonna look, or, or if you're a healthcare administrator, RN, MSN, whatever, that's what's gonna differentiate you. Okay, so this is another case. This is the techno-creepy pediatrician. And um, so this pediatrician decided to use this avatar for his Google Plus profile and uh, so what's the problem with this? What are you gonna tell this guy? What? It's kind of creepy, right? Yeah, it's kind of creepy. Um, so this is me, and uh, I, so I, I went and gave a presentation at the Mayo Clinic, and um, it was a tech conference at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, this very nice lady called me with this heavy Minnesota accent, she said, Dr. Verby, do you have another picture we could use? And uh, she, would, she didn't want to say, you know, what was obvious. So um, I kind of left this online and I use it with medical students and just to make the point that uh, perception trumps reality. So that despite the, the fact that this may resonate with a, with a tech audience or with people who are futuristic, to a mom with an eight week old baby, it may not be the right thing. And so we have these ways of seeing people and um, one of the things about the, 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 the public world is that uh, it's really exposed the way we really look though, right? The way we really are and parts of our personality. And we don't want to completely squash that. Um, 
And this is uh, Z Dog. You guys have heard of Z Dog MD? Probably, yeah, Z Dog. And so, is this the kind of doc you went to as a kid? Probably not. But the point being that pieces of our personality are kind of coming out. And while we don't want to neutralize and make ourselves sterile like in the days of institutional control, we want to balance that with a, a professional image. And it's a very hard balance to find, I think, sometimes. Again, find those mentors who are, who are, who are setting a great example for you. Okay, so this is perception trumps reality. And again, my point, the transparency may bring some value. Um, I had a, a, a young three-year-old die of mitochondrial depletion syndrome, rare genetic disorder, uh, died of respiratory failure at age three. And I wrote, I wrote about the experience of meeting the parents at the funeral. And it's something I normally don't do, which it exposed the difficulty I had facing the mother and the father at the funeral and didn't know what to say, and I was frozen. And the family read it, and this, I want to say, it, went, it practically went viral, and, and people love seeing when their healthcare providers have a moment of transparency and visibility and humanity. And it's something I had never done before, and it was a valuable lesson. So some of this transparency is good, so we want to balance it. Okay, this is the case of the angry mother. So Andrea is an, an Atlanta-based pediatric GI. I'm a gastroenterologist, I told you that, right? Okay. Um, who discovered a harsh review and said, this doctor is incompetent. My daughter has constipation and she told me to take Miralax. Andrea wants to respond, Andrea, the pediatrician wants to respond and set the record straight. What do you guys think of that? Is that a problem? Come on, you guys probably physicians and nurses or hospitals get reviews, right? Do you go? Do you hop online and so we get? Yes, you want to say? As a parent, I would like to know what exactly is the problem so that it won't. Uh... Yeah, yeah, you can absolutely reach out to this person and say, hey, what, what's the deal here? Like, what can you help me understand? Sometimes in those situations, the families will take down the they'll take down the review. Uh, but you have to be very careful. If you guys, uh, if for physicians, probably nearly 60% of you are now employees of healthcare systems. So if you're in this situation, always consult your public affairs office because the way these are handled is a lot of legality. Uh, so you can't respond publicly on these uh, venues because that's a HIPAA violation because you're acknowledging there was a patient under your care. So, um, so the things we want to do, we want to avoid public responses. Uh, like I said, we was brought up here to maybe call the mama and say, hey, listen, can we pave this over, or whatever. And uh, one of the things that's really important, um, someone asked before, it was about reviews. Laura brought up, like, more reviews, getting more reviews, right? So um, one of the things that we want to do is uh, get lots of good reviews and uh, kind of dilute the bad reviews with good reviews. Um, so there's a, there's a saying called, uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. So um, I don't know if I have the case, if I left the case out in the interest of time, but um, we always like to have the front end office ask for the reviews, not the health professional, because it doesn't compromise the relationship with you, because you don't want this person feeling like they have to, they're obligated to do a nice review. And you have to be aware of the Streisand effect. Does anyone know what the Streisand effect is? You know Barbara Streisand. Well, this is an interesting story because this was maybe seven years ago. Um, they, some photographers went to the coast of California and, and photographed the entire coastline. It was like a project to, to photograph the entire coastline. And, and of course, in those pictures was, was what? Was Barbara Streisand's beach home. So it came evident to her that her beach house was in one of these pictures. So she tried to take legal action against the photographers. So what does the entire world now want to know? What's in the backyard? So uh, everyone, of course, goes to look, you know, these blow up pictures of her backyard. Um, whereas, had she left that alone, the picture of her beach house would have been part of these 10,000 pictures that make up the California coastline. Um, and it's called the Streisand effect. The Streisand effect is when our efforts to remove something or to protest something online create more visibility to the thing we're trying to avoid. Um, remember, the world 
exists now in a stream. Information comes in streams, and what's here today may not be here five years from now. Um, and these, you know, reputation management sites are, are, are precarious, they're really hard, and uh, so the more, the more you, you protest, the more you're like to draw attention. We see this all the time with plastic surgeons uh, who sue families for negative reviews, and what happens? It makes the front page news, the five o'clock news, and so when you search for that doctor's name, all you see is lawsuits from, uh, anyway. So, oh, this is the case of the digital doppelganger. Okay, you guys ready for this one? Um, Canner is a, is a pediatric resident applying for fellowship, and he conducted a vanity search and found that he shares the name with a young man from Texas. And 18 months earlier, uh, the man who shares Tanner's name was involved in a public dispute with some racially charged language. This is one of our pediatric residents at Texas Children's. He came up to me and he said, what do I do? So what would you guys, what would you guys do? This is your nursing student or uh, any ideas? What do you tell this guy? People search for him, his digital footprint, this, all this racial stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. He should distinguish himself as the doctor and separate his profile from this other tanner. Excellent point. So that's the thing that's going to differentiate him. So making all of his profiles with MD behind it, or if you're a graduate nurse, nurse, you know, RN, whatever, that's going to do some to separate not all of it. Any other ideas? Oh, yes. Right. So you guys are IT people. You know what SEO is, obviously. Um, so the, the suggestion here is SEO optimization. Of course, you need something to optimize, right? You need content. He didn't have anything to optimize, but... Right, yeah, so, so uh, this is why you need a footprint, right? So when this stuff happens. But right, SEO optimization is, 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 is and that's what the reputation people do. They charge you a lot of money. Um, so, again, content, content, content. Um, you need to control the message that's out there. You need to control the first page of Google. Um, you get a brand with your degree. Maximize it. Use images. Use health professional images. Um, remember, the information stream, stream uh, heals all wounds. Okay, this is the case of the bad endoscopist. Dr. Elihi is a, is a ped gastro at a large hospital and has had lots of problems. Uh, with medical staff, offices, and complaints. He's been sued a bunch of times, disciplinary action from the Texas board. So, NASP again is our pediatric GI society, and he, he sees that there's going to be a session on uh, reputation management. But he wants to know what he can do to correct his botched clinical reputation. Any, any thoughts on this? Yes. Well, so, okay, so the comment is the first thing he needs to do is own it. Okay, right. Yes? I, I, you need to point, to the point, to the, point to the computer. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, very good. Um, so the, the comment was own it. Yeah, and that's kind of the point here. And this is, this is kind of a core thing about online presence. And we see this all the time with people who are scamming and selling vitamins and things like this that... Um, a great public presence or a great digital footprint will never make up for bad performance. That goes for hospitals, that goes for docs, that goes for nurse practitioners. Okay, you can't, because no one, you know, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog and you can kind of fool a lot of people, but not everyone. Um, I, think this is my, I think this is my last one, then we'll have some Q&A, I think. But um, there's an OB, an obstetrician, who is a speaker for a a pharmaceutical company does these dinner programs for birth control and gets paid a little bit. ACOG is the big ob meeting. Um, she participates in a dinner panel on birth control where she's paid as a speaker. On the day of the event, she uses her personal Twitter account to send two tweets announcing the event, and I think that she's going to be maybe a new, new contraceptive that's on the exhibit floor. Okay, and she uses the ACOG19 hashtag. This is a real case. So what's the problem with this? Any ideas? Anyone see a problem with this? Any? Yes. Let me, let me get you the mic. So, 
Yes, she's got, because it, now she's it's looking that as an OB, she's going to have preferential treatment over one birth control pharmaceutical company over another. Conflict of interest. Yes, conflict of interest. That's exactly it. That was your, your point. Any other ideas with the problem with this? Yes. Okay. So you're saying that it's, it's, it's maybe misrepresenting ACOG's position or something like that. So honestly, those of you who use Twitter, hashtags, everyone uses hashtags, so it doesn't necessarily mean she's a representative, but that's, that is a good point. So the, you know, the big thing here is that, um, I think I go to the next, um, you know, this gets into a, uh, a violation of federal law about promotion and disclosure that if you are paid and you are promoting yourself on a social media profile, um, you have to disclose um, your relationship with that company. It's a um, federal law and you can get fined for it. Um, and, and so I always like to say, if you can't properly disclose yourself on the media that you're using, you probably shouldn't be touting whatever the thing is that you do with that company. Um, and we call Twitter a constrained media because you, can, you only have 240 characters, so it's really hard to explain yourself. Um, and if you are a consultant, um, if you're someone who does this a lot and you want to promote, you have to understand how to disclose yourself. Um, we, I know at Baylor College of Medicine Tech Shields, we can't, we're verboten from doing this kind of stuff, and so privates can do it, but you have to be very, very careful um, as our federal law is behind this. And so I'm just going to finish with, I, I think one of the things that's becoming very uh, apparent, certainly around uh, COVID, we saw this, we're seeing the rise of um, a digital thought leader. And in the old days, it used to be based on just research and uh, the research publications you did. Uh, but now it's driven by platform and audience and the novelty of your ideas. With democratization of media, we can all be experts. And that comes with a huge responsibility as health professionals. Um, and so you are in a great position to sort of define yourself as doctors, nurses, uh, nurse anesthetists, or whatever you happen to be doing. Um, and we're seeing this rise of the digital, digital thought leader. And so I'll open it up to questions. I hope that was helpful. Um, and we can chat a little bit. So I was curious about case law. You've given several examples where, and we were, and I am of that era, where we had to go get permission to do anything um, and get it approved. Uh, but where's the case law with the digital world and, and what we might expect? Uh, so a couple things I probably should have said in my disclosure that uh, I also don't have relevant disclosures. Um, but I, probably the most relevant disclosure, I'm not an attorney, I'm not an ethicist, I'm not a marketing professional. Uh, but uh, so the, the case law, I mean, the, again, back in 2008 during the age of professionalism, we thought there was going to be an onslaught of uh, the lawsuits with my peers, which have been less than a handful, had centered around uh, patient privacy disclosures. So I never talk about, I never talk about, post anything about work. Um, I'm always shocked at the people that do. Um, I don't talk about alcohol, I don't talk about religion. So when I consume alcohol, it's time stamped. And so if I were to have a, some sort of event, you know. So, um, so I, I'm not, I can fully comment on that, but there's not, not been a huge amount of backlash as we expected. In, Yeah. Or were, they were written when the, the world was paper. Right. And so now we're living in a digital world. That's why I asked. Yeah. So we're facing this. So the question, the, the, this idea that the HIP, everything was based, the HIPAA was based on the AIDS epidemic and so on and so forth. The thing that we're facing now, and this is happening, and it's not been resolved, is the, uh, the CAT scan that's technically de identified but has a funny shaped tumor that is obviously belongs to a woman with metastatic breast cancer. So um, the question is, is that a unique identifier? And it's something that it hasn't been sorted out, but that's why I would never share anything like that in the public space. And even on physician profile, physician networks, it's a tough thing to do. I think 
that's me. So um, remember too, the patients are going to be seeing everything that you're writing, and so independent of the legality, there's the moral aspect of it. Do you really want, how would you feel if your cardiologist was tweeting about your father or something, you know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Other questions you guys have, yes. So now that we live in the altered states of America and we've politicized science and healthcare, uh, you said you've been in this for over 10 years. Have you noticed uh, any increased risk to you or your family by being a public persona? Yeah, that's a good question. The question is like risk. Um, yeah, I've had some trolls. There are trolls out there and if you have any sort of public presence and certainly if you take on vaccines, um, issues regarding birth choice and that sort of thing, um, you're going to get uh, you're going to get these troll attacks, uh, but beyond beyond that, real safety threats. I have not felt that. Man, you guys are making me get my steps in. C can you yell? No, I'll come over. I'll come over. Now, how are we doing for time? We okay? Okay, my question to you is. As a professional practicing physician, you um, are aware of the footprints that consumers put on the Google, whatever. So what are your personal opinion about some of these websites? For example, as a consumer, I look at health grades when I'm looking at a physician. So what, are, what, are, what is your personal opinion about different websites? You mean review sites? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there's some pretty good evidence that patients don't put a lot of stock in those, that they're more dependent upon peer-to-peer -peer, uh, word of mouth. Uh, so I think, again, a lot of us, a lot of docs get worked up over these reviews when, in fact, again, the solution to pollution is dilution. But I can't remember the last time any patient brought a review to me or a peer brought a review to me and so I'm not sure I have a, anything intelligent to say about them. Does that make sense? I don't give them a lot of stock. Yes. And I, and I just want to, from the organizers, what are we, how are we doing for time? Do we, it's quarter of, are we going to break in five minutes, ten, five minutes maybe? No, okay. Um, you guys may have a, uh, yes. I really enjoyed this. Um, what's your perspective on states, um, different states are attempting to regulate misinformation by physicians in particular. Just yeah. got back from California. Yeah. Um, yeah, a pursuant to the whole COVID, um, the, so the question was about mi uh, regulating misinformation. I think it's a really slippery slope, honestly. Um, I, I, I see where it's going and I understand and I've intimately followed the people who have said divisive things and um, really spread misinformation, but it's really hard to get your hands around that. And so, I mean, it's all I can say, and I think it's a really tricky spot to be in. And I, I just don't, I don't support heavy control of this sort, certainly by the, the state boards. Yes. I'm going back to your avatar and it provoked my thinking about um, cyber security. <laughs> um, so while you've spoken about HIPAA compliancy, um, what are your thoughts or do you factor in in your talks around the security of da data from the cyber aspect of it? Uh, and security, so I, I, don't, I, don't share the, I don't share that sort of stuff. I mean, beyond my face and that avatar, I don't share information or images. I mean, beyond scrubbing the meta information that's behind them, um, again, the concern is really not with the information that's linked to the image, but really what the image represents and how unique it is. So that's my biggest concern, honestly. But I don't know if anyone else has any ideas around that. But oh, you mean on my social profiles? So you guys be happy to know I use 2FA on everything, so it. Um, I haven't had any problems yet, but it is true. Um, I've had a couple of colleagues have their Twitter accounts hacked with some very embarrassing uh, 
So I don't know, you guys, you guys are the experts. You tell me, beyond two-factor authentication or not being involved, is there? Yeah. So I, have, I haven't had that experience quite yet. I've had one account that um, mimicked me, but the platforms are pretty good about quashing those after a week or so. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so as a medical student, uh, there is a lot of residents and fellows that make YouTube videos. Um, so I know that you talked a little bit about like Twitter and LinkedIn. A lot of families are using YouTube to learn more about like, you know, doctors and nurses in the community. How do you feel about using YouTube as a platform? Uh, I think, you know, video is a very powerful platform. It's not one that I've really kind of embraced, but not because I'm in the wrong spot here. Uh, it's not one that I've embraced, but that's not because I don't think it's any good. I think it's amazing. If you have the capacity to make videos and do it in a way that's responsible and safe, uh, certainly as a medical student, you need to be, you know, clearing this through your Office of Public Affairs at your med school. Uh, they may have policies vary all over the board. Um, one of the, th I mean, it spurred an idea with me. One of the big things that's kind of becoming a problem with med students is Instagram sponsorships. Some of these medical students uh, and some nursing students have very, very, very big followings, and they're getting sponsorships and the disclosure isn't obvious at all when you look at those uh, designer scrubs and things like this. They'll, they'll appear in designer scrubs and uh, not disclose. So um, that's one of the things that just sort of spurred with me. But I think uh, YouTube, I love YouTube. If we don't have any other questions, oh, we do, we do have more questions. Uh, let me go back here. Well, you guys are full of questions. It must be morning. Yes. Um, hello. So kind of like what she was saying, um, like one of the, I think, most popular uh, social medias right now is TikTok. Yeah. And you do see like a lot of doctors or just people kind of like with like short videos kind of giving information yeah. on TikTok. What is like the liability with that with doctors kind of, or you know, just giving information because even with me, if I want to search something, sometimes now the first thing I go to is TikTok because so many people are giving information on there. Yeah. So what is like the liability with, you know, giving information on TikTok, I guess? Yeah. Remember, the, me the medium doesn't change what we're supposed to be doing, right? When TikTok's gone and something else comes along, we're still about, we're still about patient privacy. That's really kind of our core thing. I mean, there's... We, I can't get into libel and things like that. Some people, some of the physician friends I have take on other physicians and things like this, and so you have to be very careful. But I really can't speak to liability on TikTok. It's just another platform, and so the same things we need to be careful with on uh, Twitter or um, YouTube, you know, we just need to be smart. And like I said, if you guys are students and you have the benefit of working with the Public Affairs Office, you might just want to have them vet some of your stuff. Again, also find a mentor who's already doing this stuff. Um, yes, and I'll, let me go here. Hey, uh, I work in the emergency department and had an interesting experience a week or two ago where uh, I saw a little light on a patient's chest and realized about halfway through that they were filming, and I asked them about it, and they said they were broadcasting on Facebook Live. Oh. And so I'm kind of curious. I asked the patient to stop, and they did, and it was no big deal, but I'm sure there are... 20, 30, 50 encounters that have been filmed that I'm not aware of, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, and I'm curious, this is an opposite angle about managing your online presentation. Yeah. What would you do? <laughs> so, um, I'm frequently in the situation where parents will, will record, um, records, kind of record secretly. Uh, you know, I think these families need to be disclosing if they want to, I'm, and I have no problem with a, with a parent wanting to record tired mother with a baby wants to record what I said, I'm totally fine with it, but just let me know. And secondly, I, I, I hold the phone up so that they can actually hear it. Um, this issue about filming, uh, I know Texas Children's has very strong policies against that, so if someone defies that policy, they're... So I don't know what, I, I really don't know what I would do in that circumstance if I, how, did, did you confront them or did you, what did you do? Yeah. That's a tough one. You know, I, I, I've only had recording, but I can imagine um, this is reality. And, I, you know, I kind of live as if I'm being filmed anyway, so. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, that's a tough one, boy. Who's? Yeah, we're down to not, we're down to like five minutes. How do you balance a growing public um, persona and personal privacy, especially in the age when there's databases of your where you live? You know, a lot of private information out there. That's a great question. So the the thing is, a health professional should you have a separate profile for your personal world, or should you in one for your uh, professional world. The problem is you can't separate them. There's a great JAMA editorial that I can get to you about the, um, the, the fact that you, it's really, really difficult to separate these two. And so um, I'm just uh, fastidious about not sharing information about my family. Um, Wendy Sue Swanson, um, Seattle Mama Doc, who is a good friend of mine, and you, some of you guys may know, we were both very militant about not sharing pictures of our kids under age 12 or 13. And so that's the most concerning thing to me, is sharing images of my children. It's, a, it's just amazing how, how, how much these young moms will, 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 will show of their, their preteen daughters and things like this. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy. The other thing that we sort of see that's emerging in pediatrics is the the mother of the disabled child who wants to narrate the child's clinical experience and record it online. When that individual soul is going to have an adult life later on, maybe as a ambiguous genitalia that gets corrected that wants to move on with their life and there's going to be this huge digital footprint around this mother. And some of these moms really like, they really like the attention with some of this and, and some of this support that they need, sometimes it goes over the edge. So that's another ethical thing that we face in pediatrics. We'll take one more question. How does that sound? Yes. So uh, I was thinking like uh, uh, before it, uh, it was all offline for you, for the doctors, and it's all online now. You guys are doing online and offline together. So how is your private life is affecting while you're treating, tweeting all this uh, yeah, how is your personal space is affecting, I want to know. You mean how does it affect my personal life? Well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to be completely honest with you. Uh, a decade ago, I was far more involved with this than I am now. What's happened, honestly, with the medical community online is as the numbers have grown of docs, um, there's a lot of tribalism happening around, we saw this with COVID, uh, docs being very, very ugly and antagonistic towards other docs, and it's horrible, absolutely horrible. And a lot of my community or the, the peers that I was most connected with, say, six years ago have left because of this divisiveness that's centered around birthing stuff, transgender issues, all this stuff, and, and even, even, even simpler things. So um, for me, I try to avoid those things, and uh, it, it's very stressful, and um, I use Twitter as an information source, and I don't try to get too involved in these other big things. I, Try to think balance and equanimity and all that sort of thing. So, all right. Well, guys, I think I'll we'll call it. And I, I really appreciate your time today. Great questions, and I'll, I want to make one last comment for those for the young people in the audience, nursing students and med students. All these questions that are sort of unanswered. The the mother who is creating content about her disabled baby. All these things are up for you guys to answer with this next generation. Um, it, it's, your, it's yours to, to solve and fix and define. And you have to have conversations about these with your students and you need to be writing about this and publishing and that sort of thing. So let me know if I can help, but it's been great. Thank you so much, Brian. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. We're gonna keep going. Um, my name is Susan Fenton and I'm with the UT Health Science Center at Houston School of Biomedical Informatics and so happy to be here today. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Chris Lehman and literally that's the introduction I'm gonna to give to you because he told me that that's all I should tell you. Um, <laughs> so I did ask him what did he want me to say and he said just tell them who I am. So. Um, in, in, so, Chris has a ton of slides for you. He's going to share a lot, a lot of information with us. 
Um, and I did ask him about question and answer, and he said he's got too many slides. All right. So um, please know that there's a panel this afternoon that's going to allow some time for that. So as questions come to your mind during Chris's presentation, um, please write them down. Um, keep them for the panel this afternoon because then we're going to have a, a whole group of people up here who are going to be help, who are hopefully going to help to answer those questions for you. So without further ado, Dr. Chris Lehman from UT Southwestern. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Fenton. I, I really appreciate the uh, introduction, and uh, uh, I uh, just want to say, if you have a question uh, during the talk, don't don't hesitate to interrupt me. I'm happy to uh, to respond to that. So, um, without further ado, um, let me uh, get started. Um, uh, it probably would be helpful if I had the uh, handheld mic, if somebody would give that to me. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Chris Lehman, as you heard, and I uh, uh, am the Associate Dean of Clinical Informatics at UT Southwestern. And uh, my conflicts of interest uh, include that uh, I got, uh, I get a small honorarium from Springer for a book that we put together a, year, a number of years ago. And I'm the Editor-in-Chief for Applied Clinical Informatics, which doesn't pay anything. Um, this talk is actually um, uh, came out of a, a paper that we wrote uh, with the policy committee at AMIA, and you can find this paper uh, published in JAMIA if you ever want to go back and look at details. And uh, we also recorded a podcast on this that's available online and uh, might be of interest to you because it covers a couple of things that we're not covering here. Um, so what's artificial intelligence. Uh, Marian Webster defines it as a branch of computer science that deals with simulation of intelligent behavior. So it's the capability of a machine to imitate, and that's the important distinction, to Im imitate intelligent behavior. We define it more broadly as a discipline that creates computer systems capable of activities that require some cognition. Um, Machine learning is the uh, ability to adapt uh, over time based on exposure to data. So by uh, looking at data, learning from the data, uh, machine learning uh, can generate uh, um, um, knowledge. Machine learning can learn, but it cannot act. So um, AI, however, can act upon that, what machine learning has learned. So we're in a, in a world where the use of robo robots and uh, artificial intelligence is growing. Um, we have more and more uh, robots in manufacturing and industry, and uh, we are experiencing the use of AI in our everyday life. Um, when I started preparing this talk, I was reminded of a book that I read many, many years ago. Uh, Isaac Asimov was a, a, a science fiction writer from Poland who uh, defined the three laws of robotics. And uh, I think uh, I wanted to start out with it because these laws actually matter, I think, in the way we are implementing AI and uh, how we should uh, have AI interact with us. So the three laws of robotics that ASMA formulated, I think, in the 50s, um, uh, 1942, sorry, uh, was that a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Well, that's the number one law. Number two is a robot must obey uh, commands that are given by humans, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law was that a, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not violate law two or law one. So I think these are really good fundamental principles that we should actually uh, pull out uh, from that old book and dust off and uh, think about when we think about AI and the use of it. Later on, he actually formulated another law that he called the zero law. A robot may not harm humanity by inaction or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. So I think um, these are really good principles. 
Um, we already experience the use of AI in healthcare. These are examples that are currently being used that were easy to find. Uh, AI can improve the diagnosis in pathology or radiology. Uh, it can improve prognosis uh, using genetic data or other data. Uh, uh, using facial recognition, AI and facial recognition can aid uh, in the diagnosis of rare diseases. I don't know how many of you remember Smith's uh, atlas of um, human malformations that uh, uh, you could train an AI model on and uh, allow people to, to be diagnosed much easier. Um, it can use we can use AI, and it's being used already, to turn the notes that we are generating into a format of plain language that allows people to actually understand what's going on and create handouts. Um, we can predict um, COVID um, infection by uh, use, training AI on symptomatology. So there are lots of examples of uh, AI being used and uh, being applied effectively already. So who are the stakeholders? Well, everybody in this room is a stakeholder, but uh, we uh, have patients, providers, payers, healthcare organizations, society, legal professionals, administrators, researchers, we all are stakeholders when it comes to artificial intelligence because it affects the way we work, the way we are, uh, distribute healthcare, and the way we uh, receive healthcare. However, AI is not without risk. And I will talk a lot about bias coming up uh, because uh, uh, if we do not pay efficient attention to what is being used to train AI models, uh, we will get results that we didn't anticipate and that we don't want. And I'll give you a lot of examples of AI gone wrong. So, this is an example that uh, actually happened in healthcare. Um, AI was used to generate an algorithm that would predict complex health needs of patients. And that was designed to allocate resources to these patients. And uh, to train this AI algorithm, um, the uh, people that built it used healthcare expenditures as a proxy for health. So what do you think went wrong with that? So, you know, to be more precise, the more somebody spent, was spent for somebody on healthcare, um, the more they, uh, that was used as a proxy for bad health. So what do you think went wrong with this algorithm? Anybody have an idea? I could not hear that answer, but so uh, um, it can, can somebody yell that, 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 oh yeah, very good. So. There is an inherent bias because people who don't use healthcare don't spend anything, right? So. People who don't use healthcare might not be healthy, right? So uh, that's exactly right. This is what went wrong with it. Um, black patients that had the same level of illness where, but who were less likely to be able to afford the use of healthcare were flagged by the system as being healthier. So the system built in and bite against uh, people that were unable to afford healthcare. So uh, that's, that's an outcome that we certainly don't want. And uh, uh, it's something that we need to be really truly aware of. So there are a number of ways how biases can sneak into uh, AI. So they, and I'm listing here six different biases. There's the historical bias. If you use historical data, they may no longer reflect the reality. So uh, Amazon built a hiring AI tool to uh, pick the best candidates to hire them. And uh, because this was trained on historical data where more men were employed by Amazon than women, the algorithm ended up being uh, favorable to men and uh, disadvantaging women. So uh, they had to scrap that. Um, if you use the wrong sample, then uh, your eye will not be uh, accur accurately reflecting the real world. So this is, um, I don't know if you know that uh, a lot of um, 
speech recognition programs are trained on audiobooks because it's easy, right? You have, you have a voice narrating the book and you actually have the text so you can match these things. And uh, uh, so that's uh, frequent, so audiobooks are used frequently. Well, who narrates audiobooks, right? Uh, Well-educated, middle-aged white men. Uh, so uh, it, for minorities, for people with an accent, uh, you know, it will not perform as well. Um, you can also introduce bias by labeling. Here's an example how an AI system uh, was trained on the uh, uh, pictures above. So, and you notice that the lion is staring at the camera in every one of those pictures, right? So, once you then run the, uh, the uh, AI, uh, it's not able to deal with the side view of the lion. So, if you don't label correctly, then uh, you will introduce another set of bias. Well, you also can get a bias by aggregating data, uh, by not making them granular enough. So here, you know, it looks like you pretty much have a straight connection uh, between salary and years on the job. So you, the longer you're on the job, the more you're going to make. Well, if you break that down by uh, um, professions, you'll notice that uh, the opposite is true for people who are in sports. The longer you're in sports, the less money you're going to make. And uh, you know, if you know this, then you know that uh, an AI algorithm trained on the uh, aggregate data, uh, aggregated data will not accurately, accurately predict the earnings of somebody who's in uh, professional sp uh, sports. And then there's the confirmation bias I, that we, we all suffer from. It's the tendency to trust information that confirms our existing beliefs. So, um, you know, we see what we actually want to see. And in healthcare, a physician may dim dismiss an AI recommendation because it doesn't match uh, the experience or understanding that that, that physician has. So, uh, you know, uh, it, the evidence that we believe is actually at that small interface between what our beliefs are and the existing facts and evidence. And uh, AI can, uh, the acceptance of AI can suffer from that tremendously. And um, then we have the evaluation bias. Uh, you created a model, for example, to predict election, and you tested it on local election results, and it performed really, really well. But then a, you, the general election happens, and your model is no longer performing because uh, it was trained on local data, it was evaluated on local data, and that doesn't necessarily reflect uh, the opinion of the whole country. So there are lots of lots of AI examples of that going wrong. I mean, that's uh, that's an internet uh, rabbit hole that you can fall into. If you go and look at uh, examples of bad AI, you can spend hours doing this. I picked a few one for you. Uh, Apple created a credit system rating uh, that uh, ultimately gave wives less credit than their husbands. Um, uh, if you uh, look at uh, um, uh, reports to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, Hispanics are substantially more likely to be reported by existing algorithms. And it's usually because uh, they're getting biased against because they're less likely to have a bank account. Facebook uh, discriminated with its ads for um, real estate against uh, minority uh, 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 individuals. And um, we also had uh, an AI system implemented that predicted patients that were ready for hospital discharge. And it uh, demonstrated a bias for people from poorer neighborhood with more African Americans. So lots of ways of um, uh, um, finding examples of AI that uh, is full of bias and doesn't perform as anticipated. Well, um, AI can also be used for a whole bunch of nefarious uh, uh, purposes. One uh, good example are deep fakes. Um, deepfakes is a synthetically generated um, image or video that comes from a real existing image or video in which a person or part of a person is replaced by another person. 
So this is used to uh, extort money. Uh, one company was extorted several hundred thousand dollars because a deep fake of the CEO was uh, sent to the company. Um, it's also used to generate uh, fake nude images. And uh, you know, obviously, I uh, won't uh, do that to you. But uh, you know, uh, I got a, I, I got, uh, I got a lot of uh, fun playing with this. So uh, they, this, these are available on apps that you can run on your phone. So uh, uh, it, it, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun preparing this talk. So when we talk about nefarious purposes, uh, you know, just a few more examples. It can be used uh, to complete writing assessments. So uh, there are tools that will write you a text about anything that you want uh, with a few keywords. Uh, it's also, it can be used to spy on people. Uh, you know, AI is used uh, for gate analysis in some countries to identify who's who and who's where and who's participating in things. Uh, so uh, uh, that's certainly not uh, something that uh, I look forward to. Um, and uh, you can uh, use it to, to identify people with voice recognition as well. So there are lots of ways of using AI for uh, purposes that we don't necessarily want. Main, most of, main, a few of you might have heard uh, that story about Target and the pregnant teen. Um, this is an example of um, uh, uh, um, AI knowing something before actually uh, family members know something. A father complained to the local target and said, uh, why are you sending my teenagers uh, advertising for diapers and baby carriages and things like this? And turns out that target knew that the team was pregnant, but he didn't know. So how did target do it? Anybody knows? Yeah, I heard, I heard so it's the, sh it's the shopping behavior. So Target um, gives each customer a unique guest ID that is then linked to a credit card or another uh, a phone. And uh, they analyze the, uh, the purchasing habits uh, in the prior year of women who um, uh, signed up for their baby register. And uh, by knowing what people buy, they were able not only to predict if somebody was pregnant, they could narrowly tell you when you were going to deliver. Uh, so within a matter of two weeks. So it turns out that uh, you know, uh, women who are pregnant don't like things that are highly scented, for example. So if you start buying lotions that's unscented, that will trigger that algorithm, among many other things. So. Uh, and, uh, you know, thinking about negative effects, AI could have a negative effect on the workforce. You know, AI systems uh, can outperform humans. Um, they uh, are consistent and have attention to nuances and subtle details. They may disrupt existing practices and systems and change job descriptions and may even eliminate some jobs. So this is, uh, put, has the potential to have significant uh, restructuring of our workforce and potential negative effects. AI is also creeping into art. Do you see this picture here? This won a $300 prize at the Colorado State Fair. It was called Theatre Dopra Spatial. So um, that uh, image was actually generated by a program, AI program called Midjourney. So obviously the other artists who entered in that were upset and they accused the person who submitted this for cheating, but uh, clearly we, we are changing, um, we're changing the, uh, the world in every category. So I used DALI, uh, another AI software to produce images, and I typed in the word Texas Health Informatics Alliance Impressionist Style. And here are the outcomes. I think that's pretty darn close, isn't it? Uh, so uh, I thought that was uh, uh, pr uh, pretty uh, interesting how close it came. And you know, this is not a topic that uh, I would have expected great results. So AI can also lead people to do unethical behavior. People can model their behavior based on what AI does. 
So it can nudge you and uh, it can be in an advisor role, in a role model, as a partner or as a delegate. You can delegate bad things to AI. So we have to be aware of all these things that could negatively affect our lives. So in the paper that I mentioned, this, we looked at the principles that we should have for the use uh, and implementation of AI. So they, you, most of you are familiar with the Belmont principles that uh, uh, govern the way we conduct research. And um, we used uh, the Belmont principles and uh, sat down and thought about additional principles that we should have uh, and uh, reinterpreted for uh, AI. So, um, the, uh, the main principles that we're talking about uh, that uh, we started out in the Belmont report are beneficence. So uh, for AI, this means that we need to design AI that it's helpful to people, that whoever uses it or on whom it's been used, that it's reflecting our ideals of being compassionate and being considerate, uh, being good human beings. So that's really important as a principle. Autonomy, you know, usually means uh, AI can operate without oversight, while in this concept it doesn't. It means that uh, we protect the autonomy of the people on whom AI is being used on, so that we treat them with courtesy and the respect that they deserve, and that we uh, provide them with informed consent. So non-malfeasance and justice are the uh, last two principles of the Belmont Report. So uh, non-malfeasance means do, don't do harm. So um, in our case, that means we need to uh, design AI so that it avoids, prevents, and minimizes harm or damage to anybody who's engaged in it. And justice means that AI needs to represent fairness and equity. That means we need to have fair access to AI. We shouldn't be just using it on some set of people. We uh, should be... Uh, uh, you, we should use AI to uh, uh, encourage social justice and that uh, we should need to make for, uh, sure that everybody has equal access to the benefits of AI. So the additional principles that we came up with uh, include uh, benevolence, uh, benevolence that uh, uh, we uh, developing organizations that develop AI system must focus on using it for good uh, you should not use AI in healthcare to uh, maximize your profit, to uh, do nefarious things, uh, and uh, uh, exploit individuals, for example. And you need to be transparent. How many of you get these daily calls where somebody says, hi, this is Dave, uh, I'm calling from, and you know it's a bot? You know, uh, you immediately know it's a bot. And by the way, I recommend you try asking, Dave, are you a bot? Most of them will hang up right then. Um, so transparency. Nobody should be exposed to the results of AI without knowing that they're dealing with AI. So our obligation to make it transparent when we, transparent when we use AI to get, obtain informed consent, to let people know that they are dealing with something that was machine learned is really Im important. So I think these robocalls uh, with the bots are uh, unethical uh, uh, in the first place. Um, other things that uh, uh, is um, accountability uh, it's incredibly important that we have accountability and oversight over AI. There needs to be a way of reporting things. If there is any risk, any damage, uh, somebody needs to be able to report this, somebody needs to assess it, it needs to be monitored and uh, uh, fixed if, if needed. So uh, there is uh, an, an important need to have mechanism for people to complain about AI and its outcome. And uh, uh, explainability, um, you know, people need to be, uh, you know, we don't, nobody likes the black box. So we need to def set up AI, we need to build AI system that uh, 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 declare the scope and the applicability and the limitations of AI. And we need to provide consumers and people that use or apply the AI, like physicians, nurses, 
uh, other healthcare providers uh, with an understanding of how this works and why it comes to conclusions. And that means it also needs to be interpretability, uh, inter interpretable. So um, it must provide plausible reasoning for the decisions or advice that's being given. So um, uh, other really important principles include fairness. Um, you know, we already talked about this, that it can't, the use of AI cannot be discriminatory. It has to be dependable. So what does that mean? You know, if an AI system fails, it needs to fail into a safe state. It cannot leave people in a dangerous position. So think about how you could implement an advice system and it fails and people are no longer knowledgeable or trained to give that particular advice. So there needs to be an ability to fail over into a safe state, which is really, really important. And it needs to be audible uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so we must have an audit trail of AI, so the inputs and the outputs and the existing algorithm being used um, to uh, uh, you know, look at uh, complaints that come in or identify potential biases or failures. So uh, an audit is incredibly important, and that includes input, output, and the active algorithm for minimum, minimum purposes. And uh, you know, if we build AI systems, we are obligated to manage them. We're obligated to manage the knowledge that's in there. Um, you, you all have heard that AI systems deteriorate over time. And uh, you know, our uh, care system is a really delicate ecosystem that's constantly changing and modified. And as a result of that, the inputs and the behaviors change, and as a result of that, the performance of AI models that were built on historical data will degradate over time. So maintaining these systems, running the analysis again, and training the system on new data, on new populations, is incredibly important. And um, you know, the, uh, we need to reevaluate uh, uh, these AI systems on a routine basis to see if uh, they become um, less reliable. And that also means we need to put expiration dates on them. We need to put times on there where we say, uh, this has outlived its usefulness without being retrained. So um, um, AI on vulnerable populations, I think uh, we all uh, agree that uh, we need to have increased security around the use of AI with minorities, incarcerated people, uh, military uh, personnel, children, and other individuals that uh, are more vulnerable. Uh, oftentimes, then, not only underrepresented in the data that treat uh, that generate these models, uh, but they're also more susceptible to harm that can come from AI. And we need to monitor the power differential that AI can generate. Uh, so people that are in a vulnerable pop population because of illness or injury uh, uh, deserve uh, more consideration when in the applicability of AI. And that also means we have an obligation to conduct research. So uh, I, um, as, as you heard earlier, I'm the editor for ACI. And for every 30 papers that I get that say, oh, look at the cool new AI model I built, I get one that actually evaluates it that has implemented it and looks at its effect. And that is a real problem. Uh, you know, we are obligated not just to build these things and implement them, we are obligated to see if they perform as expected. So um, I encourage all of you, uh, uh, if you have something that evaluates AI, by all means, send it to me. I'm happy to uh, send it for review. And AI, like everything else, has a life cycle, right? There's the inception, the development, the deployment, the maintenance, and the decommissioning of AI. And uh, you know, it's incredibly important that we pay attention to all these steps. So in the inception, we need to be explicit about what we want to use this for, for. We need to make sure that we design it to actually meet that scope and purpose. And we need to identify all the stakeholders that are a part of this, and we need to have ethical, transparent, and appropriate goals when we build AI. And uh, we need to make sure that these goals are aligned with our stakeholder needs. 
And uh, in the de uh, development, um, we need to identify the right set of data, right? We need to make sure that our data don't have um, biases already built in. And we need to do continuous beta testing of what we build. And we have, an, have to have an understanding of the data that we're using and their limitations. And uh, you know, we also need to make sure that whatever we're building is actually generalizable and not just the limited to a, a small subset of the data that we have. For the deployment, we need to involve all the stakeholders again. Uh, we need to make sure that we educate people, not only what, uh, uh, the, about the technology, but also the expectations that we need to set. We need to perhaps deal with the apprehensions. Um, and we need to allow people to have an insight in the strength and limitations. And, um, you know, and we need to set realistic expectations. Uh, but most importantly, we need to make sure that people understand that they're dealing with an AI system, that they are subject of, to, to that. So uh, in the, uh, the, the deployment, the uh, other thing that we need to pay attention to is algorithmic vig vigilance. That's a really tough word to say. So, Peter MB, who is now at Vanderbilt, uh, coined that term. And what it means is that we uh, uh, must always monitor these systems for failure and performance drift, scope creep, et cetera. And that we have a way of escalating any concerns and being able to report on that to authorities and say, hey, all is good or you know, there is a problem. And. Um, for the maintenance, uh, we talked about the need to retrain models, um, and uh, that's really, really important. So you need to think about how long can we run this model safely without retraining it. And uh, you know, we need to pay attention to the creation, revalidation, and expiration dates of our AI models, or we'll quickly uh, practice very outdated or very bad medicine. And uh, when it comes to decommissioning, um, there are some medical legal uh, uh, consideration. You know, I'm a pediatrician, so everything I do, people have three years plus the time to maturity. So I deal with neonates. So we're talking 21 years where people can still sue me for something that happened bad. Uh, that's bad. And uh, so in our case, we need to keep the, uh, the audit logs for this AI system because they make, may, might make a, a big a difference in a, a lawsuit on culpability, you know, uh, ultimately responsibility for a, something that went awry. So in conclusion, um, AI is here. AI is going to stay. AI is going to change the way we uh, do life, uh, communicate, see art, uh, um, uh, be observed. Uh, but it, is, uh, uh, it will create significant gains in treatment and diagnosis in medicine, if it and how it has. So uh, it also has the opportunity to make our healthcare system more equitable. But we have to be very careful, and algorithmic vigilance is paramount. So that's all, and uh, I hope we, you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Everybody had a good break? Enjoying the conference so far? Hey! My name is Usha Sambamurthy. I am from University of North Texas Health Sciences Center. I am going to be the moderator for this focus session. Our first speaker is Dr. Jenny Vaughan. She is from UT Southwestern and she moved north to do her undergraduate training in Austin, and she has come back again to us. Um, she has earned her MD and PhD degree fr in, from University Southwestern through the medical scientist training program before completing a residency in anatomic pathology. She has a lot of experience in coordinating multidisciplinary teams, and today she'll be talking about Outpatient data curation for predictive modeling of iron deficiency anemia. Welcome, Dr. Jenny. Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Sambamurthy. Um, again, my name is Jenny Wan, and I'm actually one of the first year clinical informatics fellows at UT Southwestern, so I'm happy to present to you today one of the projects I'm working on, outpatient data curation for uh, the prediction of iron deficiency anemia. Okay, so uh, first a little bit of project background. Um, iron deficiency anemia, which I will hereafter refer to as IDA, uh, can have an insidious onset and herald multiple underlying diseases, um, including malignancy. So our overarching goal is to generate a predictive model using outpatient lab data that identifies patients at risk for developing IDA six months prior to when traditional iron studies would establish the, establish the diagnosis. So far, up to date, we have um, outlined an applied framework to curate the longitudinal outpatient lab data from um, an electronic health record database for machine learning. So why did we develop our data curation approach and how is it different from others in the literature? So first, there was a little bit of a conundrum with how anemia was documented in the EHR. So as you can see here, um, I know the print is a bit small, but essentially we had ICD-10 code diagnoses for um, anemia-based diagnoses. And circled in red is the number of diagnoses for iron deficiency anemia, which looked very low. Um, however, when we looked at how the majority of anemia cases were presented, it looks like most people chose anemia unspecified or anemia. So we needed a more accurate way to define IDA because likely these more general cases included IDA as well. So we went back to the drawing board, um, and unfortunately compared to some other things like if you're trying to determine if someone has a diagnosis of COVID or not, the diagnosis of IDA is a bit more complex. So first of all, um, the hemoglobin level uh, needs to be below a certain level. The ferritin needs to be below 45. Unless the patient has a chronic inflammatory condition, in which case ferritin would be uh, not a good indicator and would need to have another lab, such as percent transfer and saturation, in order to establish the diagnosis of IDA. In addition, um, over a long outpatient period, patients can go from being IDA um, and to not having IDA, and so they can be in flux. Um, we looked at how others tried to approach the problem of predicting iron deficiency anemia in the literature, and we saw that others um, such as the study from Iran, tried to simplify the definition of IDA by suggesting to just look for iron levels of 40 micrograms per deciliter or below. And a study from China simplified IDA as being hemoglobin levels of 110 or below um, that improved with iron supplementation. Um, so we wanted a more holistic approach and one that followed the guidelines that we've stated. So for our, from this point forward, I'll present to you our four-step framework for how we curated this longitudinal outpatient data. So here is a brief summary of our data pool. We covered about 15 years worth of data at UT Southwestern and pulled data points such as coded diagnoses, basic labs such as BMP or CMP, um, the iron studies so that we can uh, generate our outcome, and um, patient demographics as well as some clinical histories. And the total number of patients uh, was about 500K, and the total number of encounters was about 3 million. The first step of our data curation framework is to assess data counts and missingness. So at first, everything kind of looked okay. We had um, about 2 million outpatient visits that we could use. Um, the outpatient hemoglobin values looked like it had a relatively evenly distributed bell curve. Uh, but then we did come across several anomalies. I uh, will not cover all of them today for the sake of time, but I thought that this graph in particular was very interesting to look at um, because it demonstrates how exactly changes at the institutional level can cause um, big bumps in your data. So first, um, we saw that for points of contact, uh, which is the same as the dates of encounter, there was a large bump from the 2006 to 2008 year. Um, and after talking to some of our senior data analysts, we found out that this was actually due to data migration um, for consolidation of the hospital system that happened during this time period. And there's also a separate bump in 2016, which um, 
we had also asked about and found out that this actually correlated with the period of time when we opened our new Clements University Hospital. And so it was a deliberate increase in business during that time period. Um, so because the 2006 to 2008 period uh, likely was a falsely elevated bump due to data migration, we excluded everything before September 20, um, 2008. The second step of our data curation framework is to define the outcomes and generate all permutations. So as mentioned earlier, IDA has a complex definition, and so we work together with our expert clinicians in order to define IDA in such a way that our predictive model can accept it. So we went with a hemoglobin level that is lower than the lower limit of normal based on the reference range, ferritin less than 45, or a ferritin between 45 and 100, and a transferrin saturation less than 19%, again, for those in which um, they may, these patients may have chronic inflammatory conditions. And then all of the above must be documented within two months of each other. Since not every patient over a long period of time may have every type of lab available, we had to um, define all the permutations. So let me take you through this complex diagram step by step. Um, I'm not sure if there's a laser pointer on here, actually. Okay. So um, first, if a patient has a hemoglobin value present, then they can be defined as being anemic, which is inside this smaller blue circle, or non-anemic, which is outside that smaller blue circle. Um, if a patient has a ferritin lab, then they can be considered iron replete, which is outside this smaller circle, and then iron deficient, which is inside this smaller green circle. So our positive outcome is the overlap between those that are iron deficient and anemic, or iron deficiency anemia, which is in red here. Um, those areas that are all shaded in pink would be considered our controls, and then those in gray we decided to exclude because these are patients that are either anemic, but we have no idea what their ferritin status is, or they're iron deficient, but we don't know what their hemoglobin status is, so we can't say for sure if they're iron deficient, if they have iron deficiency or not. Um, and then in total, from generating all these permutations, we were able to find about 16,000 encounters for which um, they met the definition of iron deficiency anemia. As alluded to earlier, patients over a long outpatient period can go from between um, having IDA or not having IDA, and so there are multiple different patient scenarios that we had to take into account. Um, to basically simplify this um, scenario, we um, basically took all episodes of, uh, that are non-anemic, whereas for when patients became anemic, we only took the first um, episode into account for the predicted model. The third step of our data curation framework is to define the prediction time horizon. So again, our goal is to predict iron deficiency anemia six months before traditional iron studies would. So our outcome window is defined by when they are diagnosed with IDA. So for that, we looked at the ferritin encounter, and then for the definition of IDA, you need hemoglobin values. So we wanted to take the hemoglobin value that's closest in time to that ferritin encounter. As far as how far to look, um, by conferring with our clinicians, we decided on a window that should be minus 60 days or plus 14 days from when that ferritin encounter happened to look for a hemoglobin value. Then six months prior to when they are diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia is when we want to predict that they would develop iron deficiency anemia. So that is our encounter for prediction. Uh, in between is our gap window, and then prior to the encounter for prediction is when we would have our feature window, um, basically where our predictive model will be looking at the lab components that we'd be utilizing in order to hopefully predict that they would develop IDA. Um, step four is to compare summary statistics of labs with expected values from performing labs. So first, let me tell you about how we um, chose our features for our model. Um, the original data set that we pulled had about 1,500 lab components in total over that long 2008 to 2020 period. And in order to streamline the algorithm and hopefully 
make it run faster and not take up too much memory, we decided to reduce these to about 55 features uh, manually. So we looked at the total counts of the lab component. Basically, we wanted to make sure that we're not choosing anything that was only ordered a handful of times over that period. Uh, we wanted things that are biologically plausible to IDA, things that would likely be related to iron deficiency anemia, and then we grouped components with um, high confidence of similarity. So basically lab components that had similar sounding names and then also similar summary statistics such as having the same average or standard deviation. And then um, on the left hand side you can see um, the examples of some of the 55 features that we chose. And Lastly, for those with unusual counts, we cross-check the data with those in operational reports used by laboratory personnel. And so with that, I'd like to conclude that we provided a four-step framework by which um, preparation of retrospective longitudinal outpatient data can be prepared um, prior to developing a predictive model and future work will focus on the development of this model and hopefully its in integration into the clinician's workflow into the EHR. And with that, I would like to thank my team um, that has helped us with this project. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Where's the sweet spot for that? Thank you. Just repeat the question. Well, our um, vision for this predictive model would be to incorporate it into um, EPIC, which is our electronic health record. and only let it be available to those outpatient clinicians who may be um, following up with the patient, possibly someone that they haven't seen for a while before. And hopefully at that point in time, um, the predictive model will be running in the background to see based on their prior labs if they will develop iron deficiency anemia. If the model is likely to, um, if the model shows that they're likely to pr predict iron deficiency anemia, then I think, um, this part, we're, we're still going to work out with our clinicians to make sure that there would be um, some risk-benefit ratio in terms of what treatments that they would provide or what steps that they would take. But I would imagine it would be something along the lines of um, making sure that the patient comes back more frequently to get checked to see if they would develop anemia. Um, if they feel like perhaps this patient is in a risk category in which they're at risk for a GI malignancy, maybe they can go ahead and go um, scope the patient if they feel that their benefit is much higher than the risk. Um, and otherwise, um, I think in general, the idea is to really alert clinicians ahead of time to just be vigilant to make sure that this person is heavily followed up upon. Um, thank you. This is a very interesting model. I was just wondering what you would be doing to account for some of the physiologic changes with pregnancy and the data collection that you're doing um, and how that would potentially alter what interventions for the clinicians downstream after the, the model has been established. Um, so I, um, if I understood correctly, you're asking um, how would this take into account if patients had a the specific um, situations such as if they were pregnant, because in pregnancy they can be at risk for iron deficiency anemia? Well, just by virtue of being pregnant, um, there's a dilutional effect to the hemoglobin. And so some of the numbers and the data points you're pulling are going to account for that unless you're specifically excluding those populations. That's true. Um, I do agree that the pregnant population would possibly be um, something that we may have to consider separately. Um, because of the points that you just alluded to. Um, I will say, I think maybe it might depend on how many patients in our data set would have those same parameters, like how many patients would be pregnant and if that would be enough to account for um, those potential problems that you're mentioning. Um, but I think our idea so far, um, because it's kind of still early in the, in the stages of development, that we would go ahead and try to run the model as is and see what patients may be missing out of that particular output. And based on that, we'll tweak the model. Um, but I definitely do agree that it's certainly a point that we must consider highly. Is that my, my cue that I've used up the 15 minutes? Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Jenio. It's a very interesting presentation. Of course, we ran out of time. I know that there are many questions. And please reach out to her if you have any questions about the presentation today. Thank you so much. OK. OK, our next two speakers are Anna Alexandrik and Henry Anderson. They are both uh, from here, from UT Arlington. When I was talking to them about introducing them, they said, introduce us as coders who cry a lot. So for those of you who are in informatics and AIML world, you know that 90% of the time we slog just code, 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 either in Python or R in SAS or in SPSS. So here are the two coders, <laughs> as well as um, they have, a dig uh, Anna has a degree in computer science, and I found out that Henry has a degree in linguistics, and he uses this for natural language processing. So welcome both of them, and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm gonna sit down for the first couple minutes of this. <laughs> Hope you don't mind. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you all for being here today. Um, so, as she said, my name is Anna and I'm a third year PhD student in security and privacy and I'm also a research assistant in health informatics. And this is my colleague Henry and um, he's actually a data scientist at UTA University Analytics. Uh, the project we'll be presenting today is called Not All Emotions Are Equal, Facebook Data as an Indicator of COVID-19 Vaccine Hesitancy in Texas. This is a project that has been supervised by Dr. Shirley Nilizade and also Dr. Uh, Gabriela Wilson. So, um, as we all know, as, uh, once the pan pandemic started, uh, vac vaccination showed as the most effective um, public health intervention to uh, prevent such a crisis, such as pandemic, right? However, vaccine hesitancy represents a big threat to public health efforts. And also, there are a lot of uh, previous studies that show that uh, fear and anxiety about the vaccination, as well as the concerns about adverse effects of the vaccine, are the main problems why people choose not to get vaccinated. So basically what we are trying to do here is we are trying to show that social media can be a, a great tool for identifying vaccine hesitancy in different areas. So uh, here you can see four basic steps that uh, we are trying to follow here. So we are collecting social media data and we are detecting sentiments and emotions of social media posts in social media vaccine related posts. Then we are analyzing the data that can provide us some useful insights into the uh, public acceptance of the vaccination in different areas. Then we are trying to identify populations that are expressing more negative sentiment and anxiety towards the vaccine. And finally, we are trying to uh, perform some kind of interventions to reduce vaccine hesitancy in these populations. So in this study, uh, we are focusing on examining vaccine hesitancy in Texas. Um, there are many, many related and previously done studies that are focusing on analyzing vaccine hesitancy of English posts at the national level in the United States. However, none of the previous studies examined vaccine hesitancy in, specifically in Texas. In addition, in Texas, uh, we have um, approximately 7.6 uh, 7 uh, million uh, 7.6, yes, it was 7.6 million people aged five or older who uh, speak Spanish at home. And also we have uh, 3 million people uh, who speak English very well. So we are kind of assuming that these people, they might post in English, but they are rather going to post on social media in Spanish. And plus we have approximately 40% of population of Texas that is Hispanic. And Hispanics showed uh, as a population that uh, with the highest COVID-19 uh, infection and death rates. So we can say that uh, as this is a big research gap, we need to try to address vaccine hesitancy in Hispanic population in Texas. Also, uh, we were wondering what kind of social media platform is uh, 
the best for us to use for uh, such an analysis. And we realized that the 72% of Hispanic uh, population report using Facebook compared to other social media platform. So that's why we decided to collect data uh, specifically from Facebook for this study. Uh, and here in this figure, uh, you can see the steps we took in order to uh, collect data from Facebook. So we started off by creating a list of vaccine-related keywords that yielded a significant number of posts that are vaccine-related in Spanish. Then, by using this set of keywords, we used CrowdTangle tool to collect Facebook Spanish data for, ent for entire 2021. Afterwards, uh, we are performing certain uh, machine learning models to detect emotions and sentiments in these uh, collected posts, which Hen Henry will explain it to you in a bit, in more details. And then finally, we are using the output of these machine learning models, uh, which are actually emotions and sentiments as an independent variables in our regression models to uh, try to find any correlations in the data. Okay, so. Uh, we tried collecting data for uh, 20 counties in Texas with the highest number of COVID-19 cases. However, for eight counties, we were not able to uh, extract a sufficient number of posts. So uh, these counties were discarded from the data set, and our final data set consists of around 25,000 posts, which are, which are posted within um, 12 counties that are circled in green here um, on the right in the uh, dashboard of Texas counties. The main dependent variable and what we are focusing on in this study is a vaccination increase per week. And here on this graph, you can see uh, the distribution of weekly vaccination increase per county. And now I will let Henry go through uh, sentiment and emotion detection models. Thank you, Anna. So, as Anna's mentioned, our primary focus here is in identifying the ways that sentiment and emotional content of Facebook posts can be related to vaccine hesitancy at the county level within Texas. One way we could have approached this is getting a bunch of money, paying a whole bunch of undergraduate, graduate students, mechanical turkers to take a couple of weeks or months to do this over 25,000 Facebook posts. That's obviously not going to be very scalable. One of the things we're hoping to get out of this sort of work is kind of a proof of concept for what a system might look like that could be deployed for more short-term or quick turnaround public health interventions. And we simply aren't going to be able to get that sort of speed or scale if we have to have a bunch of manual annotation. Hence, we're reaching for a bunch of tools from sort of my home field of natural language processing to do some automatic extraction analysis of sentiment and emotional content of these Facebook posts. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to gloss over a lot of the technical details and challenges here for the sake of time, but please come talk to me afterwards if you want to get an earful about transformers and different varieties of world Spanish. Uh, there, are some very <laughs> there are some very interesting challenges that are posed by trying to do this work in Spanish. As Anna mentioned, the vast majority of this work, both in public health and in natural language processing, has been done in English. So we had to go through some trial and error, some experimentation, and we ended up settling on a set of models from a Python library called PySentimiento. They didn't tick quite every single box we would like to be ticked, but they ticked more than any other set of models that we came across. For the very quick overview, again, glossing over all the technical details for time, talk to me if you want the earful. There are two models that we're borrowing from here. The first is one that does sentiment analysis. It will annotate for positive or negative sentiment in a post. And the second one is a model that annotates for emotional content in a post. Both of these are uh, built off of a type of model called Beto, which is one of these gigantic pre-trained language models that's been pre-trained on Spanish, that's kind of all the rage in natural language processing these days. And we have two models that were fine-tuned for social media sentiment and social media emotion. So these are the ones we've gone with. After we ran our 25,000 posts through, got the annotations, did a little bit of initial exploratory analysis, we ended up extracting these five uh, measures out and used them as independent variables in our regression tasks. We're focusing on positive sentiment, negative sentiment, joy, anger, and fear. In addition to those, based on uh, some of the literature, we have also included a few control variables that have been shown to be important uh, correlations, important correlates with vaccine hesitancy and other public health outcomes. We're focusing on health literacy, which roughly is the ability of an individual to identify, understand, and then act on information relevant to health decisions. Social vulnerability index, which is a measure of 
essentially how negative are the effects that are experienced by an individual or a community when there's an external stressor, like a pandemic, applied. And we're also pulling in uh, some information about racial and ethnic compositions of these counties because that tends to be a proxy for a lot of other uh, socioeconomic and sociodemographic things. So, have our control variables, we have our sentiment, we have our emotions. We start running some statistical analyses through uh, some, some linear regression models. And again, skimming over some of the technical details, the high level findings that we got out of this is that there was a strong statistically significant negative correlation between negative sentiment and vaccination rates and between, the other one? and between fear and vaccination rates. Positive sentiment and the other emotions we were looking at did not have uh, significant correlations with vaccination rates in our particular data set. So, main takeaways from all this. Not a lot of people or not a lot of research had looked at this question of sentiment and emotion in Spanish Facebook posts or Spanish text in general as it relates to vaccination rates and public health outcomes. We see our work as contributing to filling that hole in the literature. We also see our work as contributing a proof of concept for what uh, a workflow or tool might look like that could be used for identifying areas uh, within the state or identifying specific communities within a state that may be candidates for more specific or more, uh, more targeted public health interventions around, in our particular case, vaccine hesitancy, but we would hope to see this broadened out to other public health outcomes as well. That brings us right to the end of our talk. Um, this work has been submitted to the journal Vaccines, so hopefully within a couple of, uh, before too long here, there will be a full paper with more details out. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll take some questions. Okay, yes. I have a very simple, maybe naive question, but I know what my Facebook feed looks like. How do you access all this data? I mean, how do you get to the source data? I may, like I said, I might just be the only one who's wondering. So uh, there is this tool, it's called CrowdTangle. It basically lets you search for posts based on the keywords, location, language. Um, it provides uh, with the data uh, coming from the popular pub and influential public pages with more than like 25,000 followers or something. So you basically tell, tell it what dates you want, what keywords, and it just generates data for you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, if Pai Sentimiento takes into account the different groups uh, that speak Spanish, let's say, for example, Mexican, they say different words compared to different locations and so forth. And if that was taken into account, that's pretty much based on my ignorance. And my second question is how do you take into account the SBI into your model, given that this is more like a uh, based on the data that was extracted, was it at an individual level or is it more on a local county level? Because those changes can certainly vary like from one zip code to another. And then, and so those two questions, thanks. Okay, yeah, uh, very good questions. So I'll answer them backwards. Uh, to the second question, all of our analysis is done at the by county and by week. So we collect the Facebook posts by county, we annotate them with Pai Sentimiento, and then we're, I think we were just averaging them by week. No? Clustering. Clustering by week. Probably should Anna answer that question. She was the one who did that part. Um, to the first uh, question about the different varieties of Spanish, uh, ask me about that after the talk because I have a lot more to say about this. Um, Pai Sentimiento, the data that it's fine-tuned on for the sentiment and the emotion task does include multiple varieties of Spanish, including uh, Castilian, Mexican, and several other varieties from Central and South America. We did look for uh, models that were trained exclusively on uh, North American varieties of Spanish, Texan, uh, Texan, Mexican, other varieties in the US. We couldn't find one that was trained exclusively on that sort of data, and that's kind of what I was alluding to er earlier when I said that Paisentimiento doesn't tick every box we would like to be ticked. But most of the other models that we found and the other tools were usually exclusively Castilian Spanish, which we didn't feel comfortable uh, applying to this particular data set. So, Yes, it's kind of taking into account the, the different dialects and varieties of Spanish, um, but that's an area that would certainly be an interesting place for future work, is diving further into that and more fine-tuning it to Texan, Mexican varieties of Spanish. But thank you, very interesting questions. Uh, 
do we have anybody? Uh, up, oh, yes. Sourcing. Um, so Facebook has a public, you can share with the public or you can just share with your friends. And can you speak to the source data? Are you just able to only analyze publicly shared data or is there some way to access what's shared on the friends but de identified? Because that gets to the sampling issue that Dr. Lehman. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so there is not really a way for us to analyze data that is um, private, especially for private accounts. So the only data that is available is public data that is posted within the public pages. So basically what people are posting in these influential public pages is what is available, for face, especially for Facebook. They're a little bit more rigorous compared to like Twitter where you can get data from, let's say, even though these are personal accounts, but they're still public, if that makes sense. I'm not sure whether that answered your question, but <laughs> any other questions? Uh, nope, I think we're being kicked off for time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. We're sticking around for a couple yeah, yeah, minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just like, I wanted to thank both Anna and um, Henry. And I know how difficult it is to do the sentiment analysis, having done that with my PhD students. And congratulations for, you know, for the results you got so far. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Wow, thank you. OK. I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, Dr. John Robert Batista. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Information at UT um, Arlington. Um, at Austin, sorry. His research focuses on emerging technologies such as smartphones, social media, blockchain, and artificial intelligence for health-related purposes. And he has published a lot, and he's going to talk today about development and validation of the AI ethical concerns in inventory healthcare. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, you very much Dr. Samamurthy, for the generous um, introduction. Okay, so um, I'll be presenting um, our ongoing work, which we entitled as Development and Validation of the AI Ethical Concerns in Inventory Healthcare, or simply we call it as IC. So um, I'm the one presenting here, and I work with Ria Alex and Kenneth Fishman, all from UT Austin. So um, this is a collaborative work between the School of Information and Good Systems. So I recently, over the summer, I received a funding from Good System, which is a UT Austin Grand Challenge, which aims to uh, make ensure that technologies such as artificial intelligence are designed and implemented for the good of society. So, um, first thing that um, we, need to, to, we need to take a look at in terms of looking at AI in the context of healthcare is that recently, the World Health Organization published uh, guidance which says that to fully reap the benefits of AI ethical challenges for healthcare systems, practitioners, beneficiaries, and medical and public health uh, practitioners must be addressed. So WHO is saying that before we even implement this, we need to make sure that all of the ethical challenges needs to be addressed. And the problem there is that how could you address something if you're not able to acknowledge it? And the first step is to understand what these are. So there has been some issues about operate, 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 uh, operationalizing AI ethical concerns in healthcare. So what do we mean by um, opera, opera, uh, operationalizing? So, well, it's a challenge in the field of AI ethics in general. So it's not only in, AI, in healthcare, but in other fields wherein AI is being um, implemented. So why do we need to operationalize it? So operationalization means that we're able to know what 
AI ethical concerns means by looking at some of the concepts behind it and understanding what are the items behind it. So it's a means to measure that concern. So what are people's concerns about AI when being used in the healthcare space? And once we have a way to measure it, we can do surveys from it. And once we have a survey tool that is valid and reliable, eventually we'll be able to get the stakeholders' concerns. As mentioned earlier by um, Professor Lehman's presentation, there are various stakeholders in terms of implementing AI in the context of healthcare. So we need to get their um, concerns about it. And there's a way to rank it if we have a valid tool. And once we have the results of that kind of research, we'll be able to inform policy design and implementation of when implementing AI in terms of health. Unfortunately, for now, uh, there are several research gaps. Um, we don't really have a proper tool, and there are some items that were intended for use in terms of the use of AI in government and education. There's one study that actually lists and proposes several items in terms of AI concerns in terms of healthcare, but they're not thoroughly validated. So the goal now is to at least create a survey tool by which we can measure people's sentiments on their eth um, ethical concerns in the use of AI for healthcare. So I'll be dividing the work into three phases. What I'll be presenting is the phase one. Later on, at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll be sharing what would be phase two and phase three. So phase one is to actually develop the version one and to arrive at the version two of IC. Let's start with how did I do the version one. So um, we adopted some of the items from Martin Ho study in 2021. So they identified several AI ethical concerns categories, ranging from privacy, fairness, accountability, transparency, safety and cybersecurity, human oversight and autonomy, explainability, future of employment, responsible research funding, education about AI, certification of AI products, ethical design, health-specific deliberations, and AI in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we as a team del deliberated each of the items and made some changes to it. Okay, so we did some changes in terms of like reducing them, transferring uh, items from one category to the other. And we asked seven experts to actually judge the item level content validity index. So this is the quantitative results and the scale level content validity index. So we can discuss later more um, during the break time, more of the specifics of this, but this one way to measure at least the content validity of the items. And we also use the modified Kappa index to account for the chance. So in terms of judging whether the items can be retained or not. So eventually um, we got, um, we asked seven experts to look at it. So the experts are diverse in terms of composition. And we look at the items. So the green is our excellent ones in terms of their kappa, which means that we don't eliminate them. So we don't eliminate those that are excellent, good, fair, but we eliminate those that are poor. But that's just the surface level. Uh, what's more important are the qualitative um, results. But I mean, at the scale level, the scale level content validity index is 0.80, which is pretty acceptable. But just, just a surface in terms of evaluating the scale. Um, we also asked them some of their feedback. And this is the most important part because this means to actually revise the items to make sure that somewhat we um, make sure that the items are clear and that they are ready in terms of dissemination. So in terms of version one, we take a look at the expert's feedback and modified them and res this resulted to version two. So we did that for each item. So literally all items were revised. So this is a summary of how we did the revision and this is a list of the version two. So what happens now with the version two? So this is a mouthful. Um, you can look at the items. I can, I mean, I think the slides will be posted. You can take a look at the specific items later. But eventually, my, our plan is to 
pilot test it with a specific sample first. Uh, we decided to start with 500 US physicians based on psychometric considerations. Um, 10 items per um, each item around 280. We would perform exploratory factor analysis on confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling to look at the factor structure. And from that result, we'll be able to per create the IC version number three. If you're interested to do a pilot testing of the survey, you can scan the QR code and indicate your email. So I can send you the, uh, the invitation once the IRB is um, approved. So any uh, physicians out there, you like to test the survey, can scan the QR code. Eventually on phase three, given that we have successful funding, we'd like to conduct a nationally representative survey of healthcare consumers and professionals to be able to compare differences in AI ethical concerns in terms of using it for healthcare purposes and eventually create a final form of IC, which is the version four. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward for the questions. Again, the QR code. And um, I acknowledge that I received funding from the good systems for this project and from the Boyve and Bullard Postdoctoral Fellowship of the School of Information. Thank you very much and I look forward for your questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think my purpose really here was to actually, I hope, can you show my QR code? Some people might be scanning the, I mean, this, uh, this, this presentation is actually just presenting the preliminary work and actually a recruitment opportunity, okay? So um, that's one of the purposes of attending here. And I'm really glad that the, for TIH IA 2022, the, Foc the focal area now is AI, and I'm really glad to be able to contribute on that space. Okay, there's one question, I think. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, quick question. So once you have the results from the structure question and uh, modeling, are you planning to either subgroup them into different categories or to modify the subgroups or the question itself? Yeah, the good thing about um, doing an exploratory factor analysis first is we'll be able to see whether our theorized categories for AI ethical concerns matches the actual data set that is based on reality. Next, the exploratory factor analysis would guide the analysis for the confirmatory factor analysis to show whether the, the results from EFA is actually confirmed using the CFA. So we believe that IC, our preliminary categorizations, are just preliminary and they would, they're subject to change depending on the results of that survey. So for now, we start with 500 US physicians because most of AI interfaces like in pathology and radiology and some in note taking are being experienced by physicians. But we hope that once we um, clear some of the things that need to be done in terms of revising the, the survey form, we'll be able to test it using different stakeholders. So it's still subject to change, and that is something that I really look forward to. I think there's one question. So if you'd again, if you'd like to test the tool, you can approach me. I, I mean, collecting data from 500 US physicians is not that easy. Okay, I plan to use Twitter, med Twitter, hashtag, please answer this survey, there'll be $5 Amazon gift voucher. We have limited funds, so please, uh, apologies for the $5 voucher. If you want to get the voucher, you write your email. If you, don't, if you want to make a generous contribution, you don't need to write your email after answering the survey. Questions? Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. I think these kinds of ethical uh, concerns are really important, especially as we use um, artificial intelligence more and more in industry and for uh, healthcare applications. Is there a standard, standardization between these kinds of decisions for different, um, different groups like 
uh, you know, across companies or between uh, educational institutions? Yeah. Um, one of the main purpose of developing this tool is to be able to compare stakeholder sentiments. And health consumers might have different level of ethical concerns with practitioners, with healthcare administrators, with healthcare policymakers. And I'm really excited to know the nuances in terms of if there, if there are any differences at all, or everyone shares the same concerns, like which is the number one concern? Is it about safety? Is it about the explainability of AI? So we don't really have an, an actual result in terms of surveys right now that actually answers that kind of question. It's on a large scale. It's like what people are really concerned about AI. We mostly see studies that are like interviews or in a specific set of population. And rarely there has been a tool that is described that is valid enough to make comparisons across different groups. So I think this would be a first step to know those differences. And hopefully I can share this result once we have the data. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, John. And very, very interesting project. And uh, let's give him another hand, because I know it's very, very difficult to go into the field of AI and ethics. And, and I think, as it was you know, um, um, said this morning as well, I think it's a very, very important field for us to be focusing on. And let's, we have to face it head on. And this is a baby step and first step. And congratulations on the effort. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Okay, our next and last speaker for this session is Dr. Shakira Moorland. She is from HAM Concierge Services. She is also known as the HAM Concierge, and she earned her BS degree in health informatics. She has an MBA, and she also has a doctoral degree in health sciences with concentration in leadership and organization. One of her passions is explore, exploring how the advancement of technology can be used to improve provider satisfaction while also creating tools to develop the next generation of health information and informatics professionals. And she's going to talk about evidence-based recruiting for artificial intelligence and machine learning talent. Please welcome Dr. Shakira Moorland. everybody. Excuse me if I am shaking a little bit. I'm freezing cold. Um, it's a little cold in here. Uh, my name is Dr. Shakira Moreland and I have a background as I mentioned in health information and leadership and organizational behavior and I also work in the indust uh, education industry um, where I help students to navigate their careers. Can you guys hear me now? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I help them navigate their careers, and today I'm going to speak to you about my proposed study, um, evidence-based recruiting for artificial intelligence and machine learning talent, and more specifically, career identification. Um, I'm going to be presenting along my colleague, Dr. Teets, who's over there, and she's going to be contributing regarding the impact of this proposed study on the healthcare workforce. Here we go. So before I get started, I just wanted to provide you a quick outline of what we're gonna talk about today. So first, I'm gonna go over the background and details of the research study, and Dr. Teets will discuss the implication on the healthcare workforce. And finally, I'll come back to complete the discussion with a call to action. Okay, so more than 76% of employers worldwide currently use assessments to find the ideal candidate. Um, they use it to measure competence, worth ethic, work, work ethic, and emotional intelligence. But regardless of the type of assessment employers choose to use, because there are many, each of them have a central goal in mind, which is to understand the interests and thought processes of the individual to predict future output or behaviors. 
What if the concept of candidate identification was applied to career identification as well? So as we've heard about today, um, the possibilities for application of artificial intelligence are endless with tons of areas to explore, and that's great news for the healthcare industry, but not so much for the students that are just getting started and those professionals with little experience, and the vastness can be overwhelming for any newcomer. So niching the field down will make it easier for professionals to choose a general area to begin with and then work their way outward. After conducting literature reviews, interviewing with industry leaders, learning about um, innovative technologies being used and introduced, I believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning can be broken down into four overarching categories. Patient and consumer care, which encompasses uh, telehealth, clinical decision support, ancillary services, such as lab radiology imaging and surgical robotics. Information management, which covers technology within medical records functions, master patient index, natural language processing, and nuanced intervention. Uh, revenue cycle, which deals with technology to improve encoders, accounts receivable automations, insurance verification, and capturing prior authorizations. And finally, regulatory adherence, which includes uh, innovation related to privacy, security, confidentiality, and compliance. Now, there are three aspects that this proposed study will accomplish. Number one, it will help students and professionals find out their career niche. Number two, it will help prepare students for career planning by providing a skills gap analysis. And finally, it will identify if there's a correlation between career niches and personality traits identified by the DISC behavioral assessment test. Imagine if it was possible to predict which areas are most suited based on their personality type and interests now imagine how that can be used to help them develop the required skill set before they enter the workforce. Additionally, imagine how much easier it would be for recruiters if they knew exactly who they needed to target for which roles based on the results of this study. So for this study, the DIS personality assessment will be used. Um, this behavioral assessment has been used in similar studies, um, such as to find connections between personality types and physician performance, and also to detect nursing personality models. The simplicity of the categories, either D, I, S, or C, will also serve to bring clarity to data analysis. And completing this assessment will be the first step for the participant, and this is the independent variable for the study. Um, after the DISC profile has been identified, the participant will complete an assessment to determine the career niche of the participant. This is a dependent variable. For those of us who's been in the workforce for a while, we know that experience oftentimes supersedes textbook knowledge. So it's imperative for the assessment questions to be based on real world scenarios and realistic answer choices to allow participants the opportunity to transition from concept to practice. This portion consists of about 20 questions, and after which one of the four areas that we mentioned on slide five would be assigned. After the DISC profile has been identified, the participant will complete the assessment to determine um, the career niche. Let me see. Uh, let me see. Sorry about that. Um, the final step will be to measure the participant's skill set alongside the skills needed as reported by employers and recruiters. Uh, for each skill presented, the participant will rate themselves as uh, either zero, having no experience, a one, having education experience, or two, having uh, direct experience. And this is typically about 30 or 40 skills. Once the participant has completed all three parts of the assessment, they'll be presented with a color-coded career readiness score, which indicates their readiness to enter the workforce and a ranking of their skills in order from their strengths to their weaknesses. And at the end of the study, the relationship between the DISC profile and the career um, identified, um, well, the career um, niche identified, will be measured statistically through the use of correlation and or regression analysis. Each participant will come away with about 10 to 15 
uh, page printable PDF that will give them more information on their personality type, their identified career type, job roles within their area, their readiness score, ranking of skills and actionable steps and resources to get started. And I believe that this, this study can lead to a decrease in misaligned professionals, improved employee retention, increased revenue, and most importantly, a reduction in clinician burnout. Dr. Teets. Thank you, Dr. Moreland. So what's the importance of what Dr. Moreland just presented? She actually emph emphasized that a person who is interested in the healthcare industry now has a way to determine if they're in the right area. And specifically, where AI and machine learning is so complex, this is going to be good for that particular person. I propose that there are two other important aspects of what Dr. Morland just presented. The second one has to do with patient safety and quality. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are, are as I said, complex. You want the right people who are involved with that, who have the right attitude, have the right heart, and who have the right uh, caring for what they are doing as well. So that then helps us in patient safety and quality. I also propose that a third important aspect is the repositioning of existing healthcare workers. Right now we have many that are wanting to leave and it's because of what they've experienced in the last few years. They are retiring earlier and this may be a way to test them to see there may be a niche that they could fall into regarding this particular career uh, change and keep them instead of having them leave us. So as you can see on the slide here that the the uh, triple aim used to be about patients, population health, and, and uh, cost of hair care, but now it's also about number four, which is the provider. And as I said about the pandemic, we had a lot of caring initially. It really challenged us in our abilities to, to care. Care having, uh, having to do with advocacy, commitment, uh, comp compassion, and um, and essence, and these can be measured, and they were measured, and we went down in those, and we wanted, to, we need to improve that. So with this kind of approach, we can actually do better to get the caring back, to get the people in the right place doing the right thing at the right time, because they've potentially been having moral injury. They may be burnt out, as we see from recently the um, Surgeon General having to report, provide a report on the burnout of the healthcare worker in our industry. So when we get the right person doing the right thing, we can improve the caring and bring that back. There are many efforts right now to improve our, the healthcare worker well-being. This is one of the initiatives that's going on right now. They have five different areas that you can actually act on right now. There's a lot of activity and uh, activity going on about that. But I say that there's a number six item, and the number six item is to understand what the healthcare worker is, what would be good for them, and give them that career identification that might be useful for them as well. Dr. Moreland? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So here is the call to action. So we owe it to the consumer, the patient, and our clinicians to ensure that the artificial intelligence and machine learning workforce is filled with the right people in the right place, doing the right job to maximize efficiency and improve workflow optimization. So really quickly, show of hands if you're required to take the ACT or SAT before college admission. Okay, now keep your hands raised if you were also offered a career assessment pre-graduation to help you get your first degree related job. That's why this is needed. The call to action is clear. Academic institutions should strongly consider supporting the student with career identification prior to graduation. This is true not only for artificial intelligence and machine learning, but all areas can benefit. And who better to lead that change than those of us here today? We can change the world together. Contact information. Isn't that cute with my little thing in there? OK. So any questions? Oh, 
Um, this is proposed, so we're working on it. It's a lot of work in the background, so it, it, you have to talk to different employers from around the country, um, a, a lot of different professionals. It's a, it's a lot going on right now. So there are some questions that we've developed. Um, we still have to get the skills part together, but we do have some that's already been developed, and so we use that as a template of that's sorts. That's what I was going to say. She's got the ex established. Now she's moving into the AI and machine learning. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that we developed a survey, or actually a tool, mm -hmm. for pr candidates that were coming into our clinical informatics program as actual out in the clinical arena. And we were very, at Tenet Healthcare, and we were very successful in changing the longevity, the, how much happier they were in their jobs, and we are happy to contribute that to this. Yeah, that's awesome, because I see a lot of students, they will go and they will go for their degree but have no idea what they want to do with it. They just get it because they know that it's you know the first thing that they should do. Um, so we want to change that by being proactive. Uh, I don't think that employers should be the only ones that are able to, to do these types of assessments. We have power too. Okay. Hello, I just had a quick question. Um, so will this be primarily just for like students incoming or do you guys ever plan on extending it to um, people that are already in their careers? It's going to be for everyone. Everyone. Okay. Um, I think ideally what I would like to happen is to have it implemented in different universities of some sort um, in that aspect. Um, but I think that anyone should be able to take it. Okay, so then the follow-up question to that is how would someone participate? Ooh. Reach out to me on my, my contact. <laughs> Uh, send me an email, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a lot of resources I use for the workforce, so um, I would say that. Just follow up with me, see me after this, uh, this presentation, we'll talk about it. Hi, Hello. Um, this is very interesting. I was wondering, do you have any plans to do any follow-up studies to actually look into how satisfied people are with their career choices that they have made based on you know, the information that they get from these? Um, I have not thought about that. I mean, first things first is just making sure that people know what they want to do right now. Um, I think maybe in the future can possibly look into something like that, but right now I'm just interested in getting people working. <laughs> That's it. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that fantastic idea. And you know, um, there are a lot of things happening right now using AIML to actually predict success even within school. I was talking to somebody from University of San Francisco and they are actually using the tool right now for students who are already in the first year or second year and whether they can predict the success. Of course, they are doing it very in a very narrow you know, outcome, but this has fantastic opportunities, potential to just like, you know, have the right people in the right place, as you said. And thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And thank you all for your great questions, active participations and everything. I think we now break for Long-awaited lunch. How many of you are hungry? <laughs> right? So lunch is in the room next door. And we have a poster session and exhibitor session that start at 12.45 PM. We return back here for a panel session at 1.15. OK? All right. Have a great lunch, and see you soon. So first, we have Dr. Ronald Pishok. Dr. Pishak is the Vice Chair of Imaging Informatics. He's a professor in radiology and internal medicine at UT Southwestern. Thank you for joining us. Next, we have Dr. Edward Shortliff. Uh, Ted is the Chair Emeritus and Adjunct Professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University in, in New York City. Thank you for, for being here, Ted. He's also our keynote speaker this afternoon. Um, next, we have Dr. Marie Tietz. 
Uh, Dr. Tietz is the uh, Werner Pickard Endowed Professor in the College of Nursing and Health Information here at the University of Texas in Arlington. Um, she just, uh, Gabriella and uh, Marion, ha had no problem poaching her from uh, the Texas Women University more, more recently. And um, we have uh, next uh, Dr. Usha Sambamuthi, who is a professor of pharmacotherapy and the associate dean for health outcomes research at the University of North Texas at Fort Worth. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Jennifer Roy, assistant dean for simulation and technology, clinical assistant professor in the College of Nursing and Health in Innovation at the University of Texas in Arlington. So uh, without further ado, um, uh, I, might, uh, uh, I will uh, start us off. Um, we have been preparing, the, the format for this will be that I prepared some questions that I also shared with our, um, uh, with our panelists. And uh, hopefully uh, we will have a spirited discussion uh, in, uh, on topics as related to uh, the um, topic of AI and machine learning. So um, let me start off, and uh, we'll let the panelists uh, you know, decide who wants to take the first stab at this. Let me start off with a question that uh, AI and machine learning are becoming ubiquitous, including in healthcare, making medical and clinical decisions. And um, the first question that I have is, what is our responsibility in form of declaring the fact that we are having AI implemented and we're using AI in the delivery of healthcare. What are our ethical obligations in uh, declaring this and how much should we educate patients on this? And let's see if anybody is volunteering to take the first step. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very, very interesting question. And for me, I think there is still like right now a controversy. Should we regulate or they should be self-regulating, right? But I think that all of us are responsible to conduct the ethical AI. It doesn't matter whether you are a data scientist sitting in the back room coding, as they said, in the morning, right? So whether you are that or you are uh, providing clinical services or you are actually a data science engineer who is actually doing the architecture of the machine learning, and if you are a payer, right now Medicare actually reimburses for many of the AAML algorithms that are used in clinical care. So I think all of us have a responsibility to be doing the ethical AIM. And the broader question, of course, you know, whether we should be self-regulating or there should be like Food and Drug Administration that should be actually, you know, giving approval for this AIML algorithms. They already do. Actually, in 2018, they actually approved two algorithms that are right now being reimbursed by Medicare. So I think the short answer is all of us are in this and all of us are accountable. All of us are responsible. Thank you. Um, and uh, going back to the um, part of the question is how much responsibility do we have to educate patients on the use of AI? How much declaration do we need to do uh, in, uh, in the delivery of care if we implement AI? Let's, let me uh, actually uh, um, target the, you know, Dr. Pishok, uh, AI and imaging uh, radiology is uh, becoming increasingly popular. You know, what do, if uh, we were to, for example, use AI in helping radiologists to make a diagnosis, what responsibility do we have to uh, uh, confer that uh, information? Well, uh, I just <clears throat> would say that, uh, again, we are actively using AI to do the kind of things that uh, Chris is talking about. And the, I actually lean towards disclosing that to patients universally, okay? That in fact, and, and many of our applications actually do that, that they disclose the fact that, that uh, AI performed this additional analysis, which was not strictly used for diagnostic pur purposes, but provided additional information to the radiologist to interpret the study. And, and that seems to be uh, reasonably well accepted, okay, by patients, okay? And I think the question of, of what level of education is needed is, is really quite a difficult one. Okay, uh, because there's obviously a, 
uh, a lot of information about AI in general out in the uh, you know, popular news sources and things like that, which is not really correct. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, you know, as this progresses, we need to have uh, clinicians who are uh, able to articulate that and explain it correctly to patients. May I be a little provocative here? Um, let's begin by asking why we were, would be more likely to ask this question about AI than any other intervention that we use in medicine, okay? Either uh, a therapeutic one or something that helps us diagnostically or so forth. There is a, uh, there's a kind of uh, public attention being paid to AI because of amazing amounts of news coverage and stories and probably overselling and, and the like uh, that makes us almost feel more responsibility for being honest about the fact that we're using AI than we might about, I mean, I, the other analogy I can think of is mRNA recently in, in, in the uh, vaccines where suddenly do you need to go into the details of how a given vaccine was made and what are the implications of that for the public. And some, public have, some people in the public have no interest or no basis for understanding the distinctions that you might make in, in those kinds of situations. So I view AI as just another set of methods, not that different in some respects from other things that we've introduced over 50 or 60 or 70 years. Uh, and that uh, there are uh, some patients that might in fact be frightened by the name AI if you say you're using it, but if they actually really understood what you were doing with it, would have a very different kind of reaction. So there's a, there's a uh, basically we have to be careful not to make too much out of it either. And we have to recognize that we have always been using radiologic techniques that are new to the patient that they may not know anything about and may help us with new diagnostic abilities. I don't remember any patient ever saying, why do I need to get a CT of the chest? You already did a chest x-ray, and I don't understand anything about why it's better to get a CT, it seems. <laughs> but they weren't asking for a really technical uh, yeah. response either, and they certainly didn't expect a course on, computed tomography and how it worked. So I, I, I just like to put it in a little bit in that context that we need to, we're asking a lot of questions about AI, AI here uh, uh, today that we might ask about decision support in general and there are other methods for decision support other than artificial intelligence. We almost use them as, as synonyms today but we've had decision support uh, interventions for a long time uh, and actually AI, as I'll be talking about later, we've had quite a while as well, uh, but we're using it more now because its capabilities have become clearer and we have the computational tools to take advantage of a bunch of methods that are much older. So I just wanna kind of backpedal a little bit for the notion that AI has introduced all these new moral or I issues uh, that we haven't faced before. I think it's I think it's much uh, more of the same, but with a name that sounds sort of scary to some people. And there are those who thought we should rename AI, but it's never gonna happen. It's been around too long. Uh, thank you. I think this, that was a very good topic, uh, a very, very good um, comment. Uh, we have known for a long time that clinical decision support is a great way of efficiently practicing a very outdated medicine unless we uh, make sure it's correct, right? And, uh, and AI is a very, is, uh, is uh, like decision support, if it's implemented like that, has, carries the same risk and the same responsibility for us. Um, that said, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, the inherent bias uh, that is possible when it comes to developing uh, um, machine learning models. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, flawed data that are being selected to train machines. And um, my question is, what are the, um, the steps that we should take to avoid the introduction of you know, uh, historical data bias or 
uh, uh, aggregated data bias, what, you know, these things we had talked about this morning, what are these steps that we need to do to uh, make sure that our data models are actually performing the way we anticipate? I would love to take this one. Um, I come at this from a lens, uh, I teach undergraduate nursing predominantly, and I really don't know that they understand the whole concept of AI at this point. Um, introducing that into the curriculum and educating them on exactly what AI is and why it's important would be, we, we need to do that in the future. That being said, they also need to understand what their part in this is. They enter the data at the very foundational level. That data has to be accurate. It has to be honest. It can't be a copy the um, system assessment from the previous shift. Um, and so I think that that is our ethical um, obligation as nurse educators to educate them on the importance of that accuracy of that data. That will feed all the way up through those AI algorithms um, and make them much more accurate, um, in my opinion. So I want to add to that comment, and I also want to add to the comment that, you know, this is, the, we have been facing the same kinds of problems with genomes, right? The same issues were there. But well, I see it slightly differently in the sense that the machine learning is right now, it's not very transparent. Some people would call it a black box. And when it gives you a prediction, it cannot explain why you gave that prediction, unless you go to the explainable AI and all of those things. And the other issue is also it's, it, it has a feedback, right? It learns by itself. It, you, it keeps modeling. It learns by itself. So the bias, everything, you know, which is like, you know, probably not that amplified at a you know, at a lower level is very much amplified here with the machine learning. I think that's why it is scary for many people, right? Because whatever, we are all used to the biases. We, we have seen it, we have seen it with COVID-19, we have seen it with so many other, you know, instances as well. But the way it's going to be amplified is, is all scary. And then in terms of, I want to add to your comment. So we have nutrition labels, right? in products. So I think one of the ways I think we have to think about it is when I AAML algorithm, any kind of thing. You know, Google came out the other day with, oh, we have this algorithm that predicts breast cancer, you know, 99% um, 99 accuracy with mammograms. You ask them what kind of population mix you had in that mammograms. They had no answer because they didn't have race and ethnicity data in them, right? So I think, you know, every step of the way there needs to be a labeling. Like as you said, okay, this, we have a limitation in all of our journal articles and we say, you know, here is a problem, here is a problem, here is a problem. With every single ML algorithms, I think we need to have that. We need to have a practice that, okay, this algorithm was developed only with 80%, you know, or 90% white and then 5% Asian, or we had no Asians at all in this data set. So I think, you know, at every step of the way, whether it is a data equity or algorithmic equity or the deployment equity, I think we need to have some sort of a nutritional label kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that um, actually will uh, make me shift to a question that, um, oh, why don't you? You know, I don't, I don't know how much this happens in, in, um, uh, in AI outside of imaging, but <clears throat> there are large efforts now to try to address these questions of bias, okay? Because it's clearly been demonstrated, as, as you've said, that uh, uh, it's very easy to end up training a model so that it's biased in a variety of ways. And so uh, national societies are now creating large, uh, well-curated data sets that contain uh, 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 you know, across broad populations to try to address this. And, but, you know, in the end, um, uh, it still might not perform well in your setting, okay? So the, we take the strategy of actually taking those algorithms and doing an in-house validation, so to speak, to see if it performs at the same level as what's been, you know, published for this particular, uh, you know, algorithm. Thank you very much. Uh, the 
next question is a shift from what I had prepared, and uh, I want to uh, preface it with uh, um, most of you probably have seen the movie 2001, and uh, it's uh, the onboard computer in the spaceship um, uh, ultimately refuses to let the astronaut back on board. Uh, Hal says, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. And uh, when uh, I just heard uh, um, uh, the responses to the previous question, I was struck by the fact that we seem to attach a significant emotional uh, value to the fact that uh, AI is a machine-driven process, that it's not a human-driven process. Uh, I wonder is... Um, where, where are we going? You know, where can we educate people better that uh, autonomous machines are not something that uh, is, is going to happen? That we will always have the healthcare provider in the loop in the application of AI. What? But the question that I really have for the panel: Where does this emotional attachment come from, and what are the best steps to to dealing with it? So um, as an RN and um, being involved with clinical decision support and also machinery, I don't know where I, AI is. It may be everywhere, and I don't even know it when, with the care that I'm delivering. So my, the emotional attachment to me comes more in, I think we talked about clinical decision support. I do focus in on, and all the, my nurse informatics colleagues focus in on the information behind AI, and it's my responsibility to be involved with knowing that. So the emotion relating to it is, I'm using AI with my patient and delivering care. I don't always know where it is, okay, but it's there. So what I focus in on is governance. I would want to be in an organization where I know that up all, all the way up to the executive level, there is a governance structure there that I can be uh, connected to and be, be able to deal with bias so that we have a rigorous process for identifying bias and following it. The second thing is that we have a rigorous process for the, I think you talked about it earlier, AI life cycle, okay? There's a step by step, just like there is with implementing an, an information system. System development life cycle, AI life cycle. That's where you have a, a, a phase, for example, right in the middle, where you're doing silent AI, and you're actually watching the AI system as it's performing next to what you think it should be performing, right? That's a common way. So if I knew that there was a structure in place and that, that there was rigor in that, I would feel much more emotionally comfortable with that. So I, there is some fear of it, and I, that governance and then the, the rigorous work to manage AI, and then ongoing. I love the word decommission. How do we know when to stop using AI? Then it's old. It's, it's like, wait, this, we don't do this. In nursing and in medicine, our standards of care change all the time, right? New things come up. So we have to keep track of that as well. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Tietz. Uh, that really leads me then to the next question. You know, governance is only possible if I have data that I can review and can analyze and can determine, you know, whether a system is working as expected or not. What data uh, do uh, the panelists think are necessary for us to keep track of, to audit, and to review in order to have effective governance? Let me uh, uh, answer your question with a question, okay, which is to what extent is a model that's produced through uh, machine learning and training process, to what extent is that model new knowledge? So this, is a, this is a really good question, and I think it comes um, with the fact that we are traditionally using clinical decision support based on evidence that we have collected 
uh, 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 that uh, experts have defined rules and guidances for, and that we then can implement in these computer systems, and we understand what the evidence behind it is and what the logic is, what is associated with what outcome. Uh, the challenge with uh, machine learning and what's, what makes it novel is that oftentimes it is unclear to us what the fact that one feature is connected to the outcome and has a significant effect is not always perfectly understandable. And I think that's really, you know, the, the, the lack of explainability of a lot of models is one of the novel things. So. Thank you for saying what I, what I agree with. Uh, <laughs> um, what I basically think you just said is that these models are really not knowledge, okay? There are algorithms, okay? You, and and uh, they're mathematical, basically. There's a lot of numerical number crunching that has to go on to use these. That's very different from what you have up here that allows you to be an expert and discuss uh, uh, with a patient the rationale for your assessment and, and your treatment plan, et cetera, uh, and to answer their questions. So um, the issue, I'm going to just tell you, I, in 1982, we had a CME program at Stanford. I was at Stanford in those days. And we were very curious about the criteria that physicians would use to decide whether they would be willing to utilize a decision support program. Okay. And we gave them a big, it was a survey, and we probably had a couple of hundred physicians that were at this course, and we gave it to them. And uh, uh, an obvious one, one of the things they could rank was, well, I'd want it there to have been proof that the decisions that it makes are, in fact, correct, or at least agreed to be correct by a significant plurality of experts in the field. But there was another thing on the list, which was, I wouldn't, uh, I would, I would, I would only use this program if it could explain the basis for its recommendation to me. Okay, and then there were about twenty other things as well. My recollection, well, I know that the result of that study, which we published in the old Computers and Biomedical Research, was that it was more important to physicians if they were going to accept this kind of a program that it give explanations that allow them to decide them, that it had been proved uh, formally to be correct, okay? This has been totally forgotten in the machine learning world, or at least has not been well addressed, okay? And, uh, and so yes, these are, it, it's a little bit like I, uh, you have an 87% chance of having appendicitis and if you want to know how I know that, here's Bayes' theorem. Okay, not too convincing to the average patient, right? You want to know, well, what was it you looked at? What were the symptoms? And then, you know, what were the X-rays and the blood tests and you know all that stuff you did? Well, I ran it through a program and it came out with 87 percent. So I think you should go to the operating room. That's not a very good way to to either persuade patients or to practice medicine, right? And I think that an awful lot of what's happening in the machine learning world is kind of like that right now. We can't really provide that kind of transparency that, that even you want to be able to discuss the outcome or the output with the, with the patient uh, who may have very good questions about what went on. And well, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm going to talk quite a bit about this later, but I think radiology is a special case and, and I'll explain why later. <laughs> Well, all I, can, all, all I can add is that, that, that uh, this, uh, we use you know, methods to essentially display on images uh, what features it, it, it used to come to the conclusion. So, and that, and as, as you've all said, this really is, is very important because it, uh, uh, essentially, it really builds confidence in the users, okay? That this is, there, it, concur, it is in agreement with what the way they would have interpreted it. Okay, so that's, that's very useful. And I think the other useful thing about explainability is it helps you find out why it's failing, yeah. the failure modes. And all algorithms fail. 
Okay, and the, that's the thing you need to find out, I would say. I think there also, our patients need to know that there is human oversight. You know, in the end, it's not the machine that takes you to the operating room, it's the surgeon. So I think that's important for bedside nurses, again, that's my, that's where I, I focus, to educate our patients on, yes, there is a human making this decision. So that's actually a great transition. I mean, um, we are now seeing um, self-driving cars. Uh, we see quite a few of autonomous machines. Are we going to see this in healthcare eventually or never? It's okay, go ahead. I was just asking clarification. You're talking about the idea of a, of a robot physician that you basically, you just go and... Yeah. Uh, yeah. We got robots. Uh, well, you know, maybe in Star Trek they had even you know even in Star Trek, you know they had that. What do they call that machine? The tricorder. Tricorder. Yeah. And you buzz it over the patient, and and it would tell you what he had, but then you decide. Still, I mean, Doctor. McCoy? Uh, bones. bones, yeah. Uh, bones wouldn't just blindly believe his tricorder either. I mean, he would, he, that was just more data that he would take into account in deciding what to do. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine human beings letting robots be their doctors. And, 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 I, and I, that's why I would sort of uh, uh, suggest that this business about there's a human making the decision is so crucial, I totally agree with that, but it also means the liability isn't with the tool. You're supposed to decide whether the tool's any good. Uh, as long as there is a basis for you to make a decision based upon what the tool did. It's when you have no insight into the tool, you either have to take it or leave it, that's when it gets really complicated and liability may fall more with the device. Can I say just a bit about robots? So the other thing about robots, there's service robots, but in the population where they need support, not from a physician, but maybe from a therapist, um, the elderly community now has these services of robots that help with loneliness, okay? And they are um, wild, wild west out there. Okay, there's, I go, who's monitoring the reaction of the patient to the robot? Oh no, they just take it, they buy it, they pay for it every month. I guess, I don't know if Medicare does or not. But the point there is that it's back to that governance. You have to have the human component to it, and we still become part of the medical team uh, regardless, like you say, you make the final decision, and so that's my two cents on robots. It's, it's there, and we, there's some work to be done as well. Yeah, so I, I personally think that extreme situations, like, for example, space travel, uh, uh, a base at the uh, South Pole, um, will invite eventually solutions where you're going to have autonomous decision making by uh, medical devices. I think it's, it's uh, foreseeable. Um, so uh, I think that's where the borders, where the walls will start breaking down. Uh, and uh, I think um, we, will, we will always find a reason to use the technology that we have developed. Um, that said, um, when uh, things, uh, let's, Talk about uh, the, as as a last thing. I think about the uh, legal aspects of uh, regulation of uh, AI and machine learning. Um, you know, currently there is uh, no governance governance oversight over that. Uh, is there a role for the government to get engaged in this? And if so, who should be uh, uh, engaged in this? And is this a price that uh, we are w willing to pay because it's going to be expensive? Uh, just to contrast us, uh, uh, there's a lot more oversight and governance in medical devices in Europe uh, and software. And uh, as a result of that, innovation is slower. In uh, this country, we have less uh, regulation and, and faster innovation. Uh, so 
question to the panel. What regulations do we need and who should be doing it? And who should be paying for it? Nobody wants to talk about regulations, you notice that? <laughs> also, I, I, um, I like what you presented earlier about the American Medical Informatics Association. They have the standards, they, the principles of AI. So there's associations that can guide their membership as to what the standards are. That doesn't mean it's, it's regulated, okay? But I think that it, it's definitely a start. There's actually an a, association of advancing artificial intelligence that exists. And so there's starting to be pockets of where they're saying, well, you know, you do this, but you don't do this. And there's starting to be some um, uh, har harmony, I think, about what, what people are thinking. In terms of the regulation, I just don't see our government or a regulatory body being almost, I don't know, smart enough. To, you, you have to know AI pretty well to do that. And it's scary to think about that. So I like the idea of our associations right now. I think that they wanted to speak it to it too. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to your comments, right? So you you talked about the regulations who should be regulating you know should we be self regulating or there should be an external body that should be regulating everything but there are grassroots efforts right now nih has pumped millions and billions of dollar in promoting aaml they have like funded you know centers they have funded so many initiatives and in parallel, I have even attended their, you know, innovation labs and all of that. They are also working on ethical AI. How does the ecosystem look like? Now it's an ecosystem. It is not an indi individual system anymore. Everything is interconnected because there was one um, presenter who pointed out that, you know, it's everywhere, right? And she just um, classified it into four um, buckets, actually. So there are pockets right now. And as I said before, um, Food and Drug Ad Administration already has released a framework as to what should be the principles for regulating the AAML. Um, so I think that eventually, this is my own thinking, that eventually we will have some sort of a regulatory framework. I don't know whether we will like it, you know. It's with, like any other regulatory framework. It starts with something, it has unintentional consequences, and then we keep fixing it, fixing it, fixing it, fixing it. And that's what is going to happen. And that path is going to be very, very difficult, very traumatic, and in a way harmful for some people as well. But that's what eventually is going to happen. Because we have everywhere, you know, when you talk to the community, and you know, they would say, what is artificial intelligence? What is machine learning? I'll say, do you do an email? Does it auto-correct? Oh, yeah, I know, <laughs> right? You take a GPS, I blindly follow GPS. I don't even know where I am going, right? All of us, you know, it, this has become part of our system, right? So I do think that, and it has now gone to healthcare, and many of this, like, you know, epic, um, you know, any kind of electronic health records, they will have like modules that they will sell you, right? Okay, this module, keep it so that, you know, this gives you this algorithm, this gives you like, you know, the prediction and so forth. So in my view, there are already seeds sown in terms of a regulatory framework and it will come and in what form and how long it takes and, you know, how, you know, expensive it is going to be is anyone's guess. Well, um, uh, I think this was uh, very interesting and enlightening, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Um, I, I wasn't going to take uh, audience questions, but I see one hand it being insistent, so uh, uh, feel free to... Uh, I said, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, I met with the FDA two weeks ago, and they are now have much larger budget, have a bunch of new employees, and what they are looking to do is not only regulate biomedical equipment, AI, 
machine learning and the EHR, and that is brand new. They do not know what they're doing, and, and they say they don't know what they're doing. So I would say to each one of you, because look at the intelligence sitting on the stage and your knowledge of what's going on, get involved. Sorry, but if we don't help them, they will make their own decisions, and I don't know what you've experienced, but my uh, experience with the federal government is some of their decisions lack thought. How's that? Uh, the speech you just gave was given in 1986 by, by people who wanted the FDA to get it right, okay? It has been a never-ending battle, okay? Um, those of you who are really interested in this subject might want to go look at, uh, uh, at, the, at the printed version of a speech that was given by Frank Young, who was the uh, head of the FDA. Uh, he gave it at the invitation of the National Library of Medicine as they were getting to be very much the informatic center for the uh, NIH uh, to comment on how the FDA was going to deal with the regulation of software, okay? That means even more so that we've got to get involved because I'm telling you now they've got money and they've got employees. Well, I'm, I'm not discouraging you from trying to get involved. <laughs> I'd love it if we finally got it right. I would like to make one comment though, which is the mistake up until now has been to think that they can use medical device type mindsets to deal with software regulation. I'm sorry, it's totally different. And uh, they, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any regulation, but I don't think that they really have any good models yet of how to do it. There's stuff on the, you can find on the web on the FDA site now about AI, and, well not AI, software, regu software regulation requirements broadly EHRs and other sites. Maybe their needs to change before they can handle it. Well, maybe it isn't the FDA that should do it, is what it might be. We may need a new entity that does it, some, so that has a different mindset and set of assumptions. But the fact is that this is a very long topic. We could easily have had this whole meeting on regulation of software in, in the healthcare world. Uh, and lots has been done and said and written about it. And by the way, that, that that Frank Young paper is in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1986. And it's the first time I know that the FDA ever went on the record with what they thought. And basically they said they weren't going to do software regulation. Because the, irony, the irony is if you ask the people that are working in organizations today and providers, they don't even know that FDA really regulates biomedical equipment and is responsible for the security of that equipment and all the cyber break. I mean, it's just, you're right, but we're gonna keep fighting. I think uh, Dr. Shortliff, I'll let you speak in a moment, Marion. Dr. Shortliff made a very important point um, that existing shapes and forms of regulation might not fit for this topic. And I think, um, you know, that I'm reminded of the issue of uh, generic regulations versus biosimilars. Generic regulation is very different than the regulation of biosimilars because it's a very different animal, very different beast. And I think uh, there is probably a need to come up with a different process, but I think eventually we will. Marion, I'm sorry. Uh, no, not at all. I just, before the panel ends, I wanted to let everybody in the audience know that we really have here in front of us, in Dr. Shortliff, one of the people we could really credit with the beginning of AI. I know I'm a senior person, but I was around in those days when Dr. Shortliff was at Stanford University and his very, very early works in just really opening the whole subject to artificial intelligence and developing some very early programs that had not the opportunity to have the tools that we have now. But I think, first of all, we're tremendously fortunate that he'll be our closing keynote speaker. But I thought you really have somebody before you who really knows more than any of us in this room. And we appreciate so much your uh, giving us the pleasure of learning from you. But you've done so, so much. Thank you for that contribution, uh, Marian. Um, I like to uh, stay on time. Uh, our time is up, and uh, uh, I would like you to uh, give the panelists a round of applause.
And I would like to thank all of you for being willing to sit here on the stage and uh, talk about a pretty challenging, difficult problem. And uh, I enjoyed it, and I hope you did too. Thank you. As a reminder, we have a 10-minute break where you can get some coffee, uh, go to the restrooms, and we will meet again here at 12.15 for a new round of lightning talks. Technologies to solve complex challenges. So we're going to have five different speakers. They get five minutes to speak, and then um, we are going to go to um, three minutes for Q&A, and then we're moving on to the next one. Again, I'm Susan Fenton, and I'm very happy to be moderating this. So our first speaker is Dr. Jawahar Jagarap, I'm sorry, <laughs> Jagarapu. Um, he is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the neonatology division at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He is also pursuing a master's degree in biomedical informatics at UT School of Biomedical Informatics. He graduated from Andhra Medical College in South India, followed by pediatric training in the UK with extensive work experience in the National Health Service. He further pursued his interest in neonatology by completing a residency in pediatrics at Driscoll, Driscoll Children's Hospital and fellowship training at the, at the University of Miami. He has extensive experience in diverse health systems in three countries. He is board certified in pediatrics and neoperinatal medicine. He's a digital health enthusiast, is interested in telemedicine, informatics, and artificial intelligence, and he believes they will play a significant role in enhancing newborn and pediatric care in the future. He is actively involved in various teleneonatology in initiatives at Children's Health Dallas, and his research interests include studying applications of telehealth in neonatal care, especially tele telehealth's impact on improving access to quality care and enhancing family-centered care and clinical outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jagarapu. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Fenton. Can you all hear me clearly? Okay, um, so today's topic is, um, I'm presenting about a study um, which I undertook uh, recently. Um, and this is about uh, breastfeeding and COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we all know that there is uh, increased mental health issues in pregnant and breastfeeding mothers during the pandemic. And it might have indirectly impacted uh, newborn health as well by decreased breastfeeding rates. And breastfeeding has clear benefits both for maternal and infant health. And successful breastfeeding depends on timely education and support for these women and who are increasingly turning to uh, social media for this kind of support. And Twitter has a huge influence and in networks for breastfeeding promotion. And Twitter has recently been used in healthcare research to uh, evaluate uh, different uh, perceptions on vaccinations, treatment uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a neonatologist and pediatrician, I'm interested in how um, the public perceptions uh, about um, breastfeeding and effect on infant nutrition during the COVID-19 pandemic. So objective of our study is to understand the public perception and sentiments on breastfeeding during the COVID-19 pandemic through Twitter analysis using natural language processing tools and uh, machine learning techniques. This is a retrospective study we collected uh, through Twitter API uh, uh, during the period of uh, January 2020 to May 2022. We used Python and its natural language processing libraries and unsupervised machine learning algorithms uh, to perform demographic analysis, uh, topic modeling, and sentiment analysis. These are some of the results. Uh, more than half of the accounts uh, belong to um, uh, women, and we collected around 40,628 tweets, which are related to a combination of uh, COVID-19 and breastfeeding. And most of the common source for the uh, tweets were Twitter for Android. The sentiment analysis revealed uh, an overall positive sentiment about breastfeeding topic, um, despite the mental health challenges in women uh, and during the entire study period, with a mean weekly sentiment score of 0 
some of the positive spikes in um, sentiment we have seen um, that kind of correlated with uh, external world events such as phase two reopening uh, after the lockdown uh, and also following the weeks following the uh, World Breastfeeding Week uh, campaign that happens in every August, the first week of August in every year. The emotion analysis revealed predominantly positive emotions uh, at this topic, um, and uh, trust and joy, comprising almost around 72% of the tweets which we analyzed. The topic modeling of the tweets using uh, unsupervised machine learning algorithm actually revealed uh, six distinct themes of uh, uh, breastfeeding-related discussions which are happening on the Twitter, such as vaccination safety, safety of just breastfeeding uh, um, uh, with COVID-19, and also like passive immunity transfer uh, through the benefits of passive immunity transfer for the, for the baby itself. The most popular topic was benefits of breastfeeding in the context of World Breastfeeding Week. And the topic of passive immunity transfer to the babies uh, through vaccination is had highest positive sentiment. In conclusion, um, positive sentiment, there was overall positive sentiment and uh, positive emotions associated with the breastfeeding uh, topics, um, contrary to the other topics we have examined, such as ivermectin and misinformation. Uh, and this is surprising, despite the, the mental health uh, issues which have you know, seen more prevalent during the COVID-19 pandemic. And also, there is a wide range of topics which are being discussed related to breastfeeding during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we saw from the topic modeling. Uh, these are some of the limitations. We use the existing tools, uh, which are not specific to uh, healthcare topics, to analyze these tweets. And uh, some of the org accounts, more 40% of the accounts belong to the organization accounts, which the tweets might have, you know, regarding to public health promotion. Overall, I think Twitter uh, was extensively used during the pandemic to discuss various breastfeeding related topics, and uh, such as vaccination, safety of breastfeeding. And I think it presents a unique opportunity uh, for uh, engagement of scientific community. And um, uh, while misinformation on the social media is very prevalent, um, it kind of shows that there is a need for scientific community to engage um, uh, in, in discussions, especially on social media, to disseminate active uh, guidance uh, for, the, for the public that can influence nutrition practices of uh, uh, women and you know, subsequently affect infant health. I would like to sincerely thank uh, Dr. Lehman, Dr. Medford, and Dr. Diaz, and uh, also Dr. Lex Friedman at SBMI, uh, during which, uh, during the summertime, this project was conceived. And this manuscript is submitted to International Breastfeeding Journal. And these are the references, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I would like to take any questions. Question. Do we have any questions? We have time for one question. Over there. Okay. Thank you for your talk. Um, quick question. Is, do you use another time frame to use as a control to evaluate the sentiment and uh, under a different period of time? I'm just curious if the positive sentiment that you noticed was mostly true because of the day that was happening, like the, the, the World Day and vaccination just to use this on our... Uh... Yeah, the sentiment score was analyzed over a period of, the study period was over two years, and it's a mean weekly sentiment score. And uh, uh, we, show, uh, we, see, we saw that there was a kind of overall positive sentiment associated with this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we are ready for our next lightning session. Dr. Estefani Gard Garduno, did I say that correctly? Yeah. Oh, okay, Avi, come on up here and get your slides ready to go um, while I talk about you. Um, Dr. Estefani Gardon Garduno is originally from Mexico City where she attended medical school at West Hill University and the National Institute of Fine Arts. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in health informatics at the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at UT Southwestern. She works as a research project manager for the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She is a member of the Student and Early Career Editorial Board for Applied Clinical Informatics. Her goal is to consistently improve patients' quality of life through optimization of healthcare processes. 
Therefore, she has participated in multiple global healthcare projects in which her interventions have been judged as innovative and appealing. As an artist and a woman advocate, Estefani founded Women in Art at UT Southwestern, a group dedicated to empowering women through art to promote creative thinking that leads to concrete outcomes. Her illustrations have been seen in advertisements and children books, and her sur surrealist anatomical artwork has been displayed at multiple art venues. Please join me in welcoming um, Estefani Gardano. Hello, everybody. My name is Estefani Garduno, and I am a candidate of the Master of Science in Health Informatics program at UT Southwestern. Um, did we find the clicker? Uh, he, oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't think they can see my slides, though. Oh, there you go. Well, um, the objective of this um, project was to develop an effective supervised machine learning model capable of accurately diagnosing cardiovascular disease based on individual features. I had originally two data sets, one for training and one for testing. There were 14 predictor variables, including traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And the first thing is that I, that I did was classify the variables by type. I had eight categorical variables, two nominal, four binary, and two ordinal, including features such as um, chest pain type, resting electrocardiographic results, diagnosis of heart disease, that was my outcome variable, fasting blood sugar, among others. I had also six numerical variables, one discrete and five continuous, including age, including cholesterol, systolic resting blood pressure, et cetera. And this is how the data was uh, approached. First, um, I did variable extraction. Then I randomly split the training, uh, the data set into 70% training, 10% validation, and 20% testing. Uh, developed three different models. Uh, one elastic net that was um, uh, validated through cross-validation and optimal lambda was calculated. For random forest, out-of-back error was calculated and for logistic regression, the optimal cutoff was calculated. With the testing split, um, model evaluation was performed and sensitivity and specificity were calculated as well. Finally, there was an external data set that was never seen by the model, by the training model, and we did predictions, model evaluation, and model accuracy was calculated as well. Uh, for the model development with the elastic net, you can see here how the lambda changes as the coefficients change. The hyperparameter selection was performed through cross-validation. And the packet that I used was library, uh, was GLMNet, and this is the predetermined lambda, minus 4.59. For logistic regression during the model development, you can see the significant variables below, and you can see that my AIC is 208.49, and the predictors were selected through backwards stepwise selection. And these are the significant model variables, the, the last variables that were included in the final model. And you can also see how it decreased, the AIC decreased for the final model to 202.95, which is good as the lower the AIC, the better the model fits. Um, for the random forest model, the optimal out of back error was calculated based on 500 trees and the number of variables randomly sampled as candidates at each split, there were three. And these, uh, according to the Gini score, were the most important variables in the model. Finally, for the results, um, you'll see that elastic net had an accuracy of 88 and an F score of 88. And logistic regression had an accuracy of 0.9 or 90% and an F score of 84%, which means that the logistic regression outperformed the elastic net with an accuracy of 0.90 in an area under the curve of 95 and F score of 84%. For 
random forest, you can see here in the plot that when the model had six variables, it had the lowest error, which means that that's when it performed the best. The accuracy was 83%. So finally, when the model faced an external data set, it diagnosed 151 controls in 143 cases, when in reality there were only 106 cases in 188 controls. So sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy were calculated based on these formulas that you see here. I had 89 true positive, positives, 54 false positives, 17 false negatives, and 134 true negatives, which means that um, the final model had an accuracy of 76%. Based on this, we can say the model is learning. The sensitivity was 83% and specificity was 71%. If this model were to be used in clinical practice, additional ensemble methods like boosting uh, should be used to improve the predictive force and performance of the model. Uh, these are the variables that were included in the final model. And finally, just want to thank you, um, Yuri Rapp, my husband, for all his support, Julia for mentoring me through every single step, uh, Professor Wang that taught me and endured all my questioning, and UT Southwestern professors, including Dr. Willett and Prof. Joe Bosham, for um, their insightful suggestions and support during the presentation. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We have time for one question. Okay, thanks. Uh, could you tell us what was the gold standard for your uh, model that you compared the CVD to? What was the definition? What was the what? I'm sorry. The gold standard that you compared the model performance to, uh, like the, the per, you, you showed the performance of your model. What was it compared with? What was the gold standard definition of CVD? So the cutoff was 6.64. So um, everybody that has scored above that was categorized as a uh, case, and everybody who scored less than that was categorized as uh, control. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, lightning talk speaker, is Christian Lee. Christian is a first year student at the Texas Christian University School of Medicine. Prior to medical school, he completed a master's thesis in cancer genomics at the University of Toronto. His research focused on multi-omics data integration and mutation rate variability. Now Christian aims to further combine his interest in data analytics and computational tools with his medical education and career. He currently conducts research under the supervision of Dr. Eric Chu at Baylor Scott & White All Saints Medical Center and worked at Memorial Sloan Kettering this summer as a data engineer. Outside interests include web development, violin, and sports. Please join me in welcoming Christian. Good afternoon, my name is Christian Lee. I'm a student at the Burnett School of Medicine at TCU. And the title of this talk is Predictive Features of In-Hospital Cardiac Arrest in COVID-19 Patients Using Machine Learning. So in-hospital cardiac arrest, or IHCAs, is the acute loss of circulation, which requires immediate resuscitation. There's about 300,000 IHCAs per year in the United States. And the causes of IHCAs are primarily cardiac and respiratory in nature. And IHCAs are associated with a high mortality rate. So prior, prior to COVID-19 and the patients without infection amidst the pandemic have estimated survival rates about 25% until discharge. Several studies have shown that patients infected with COVID-19 that experience in-hospital cardiac arrests show even for lower survival rates approaching 0% in some studies. 
And so broadly, we asked, can we use machine learning to improve predictions of in-hospital cardiac arrest in patients infected with COVID-19? More specifically, can we develop models that will better identify at-risk patients? Which clinical variables offer the most predictive value? And how are these variables distributed across patients? And we'll be focusing on that last point the most today. And so just to jump to the chase, we developed a random forest model that improved predictions of in-hospital cardiac arrest in patients infected with COVID-19 compared to different protocols currently used in emergency departments. And so as input for the random forest, we had a data set of about 1,400 patients, all of them had COVID-19. 64 of these patients also had an hospital cardiac arrest event. There were over 60 features for each patient, including the following main categories, patient demographics, past medical history, vital signs, and so on. We used this data as input for the random forest, which essentially created thousands of different decision trees to ultimately classify patients into a zero or a one, indicating in-hospital cardiac arrest or no in-hospital cardiac arrest. We could then assess the model performance by comparing our predictions with the actual labels. And ultimately, we found that random forest had the best performance with an AUC of 0.93. And this was much stronger than national early warning score, which had an AUC of 0.79 as well as other models we tested. We're now focusing on the feature importance as well as the feature distribution. And so what we're looking at here are some of the most top features from the random forest model. And there are six box plots here corresponding to six of the top features. So on the y-axis, we have creatinine level, troponin level, lactic acid level, and so on. And on the x-axis, zero, cor zero corresponds to the patients that had COVID-19 but did not have the IHC event whereas one corresponds to those patients that did. So here, each point corresponds to a patient. And as you can see, all these variables showed a significant difference between the two groups. And in the case of lymphocyte count, as well as SpO2, having a lower value was associated with the in-hospital cardiac group, arrest group. And so finally, we also wanted to ask, how are these top features distributed across patients? Do any of them co-occur in patients more than we'd expect by random chance? And so to do this, we used the Fisher's exact test. So first, we split the different features into low and high based on their median, based on a median split. And then we took the subset of patients that had in-hospital cardiac arrest and performed Fisher exact test. And so an example is shown here on the right, where we have lactic acid levels low and high, and then SpO2 high and low at the top. And so the numbers here correspond to the number of patients that fell into these different combinations. And so the p-value associated with this table here on the right was 0.09, and the FDR corrected p-value was 0.51. Not shown here, but at the strongest p-value was the lymphocyte count versus age, although after FDR correction, it was not significant either. And so what this suggests or indicates is that none of these significant top predictors actually co-occurred in our patients that had been hospital cardiac arrests. And so just again to summarize, in hospital cardiac in patients infected with COVID-19, is associated with low survival rates, and this is lower than compared to pre-COVID times, as well as patients that are not infected with COVID-19. And we can develop machine learning models that can improve our predictions of in-hospital cardiac arrests between patients infected with COVID-19. We are able to identify significant predictors, including age, elevated levels of creatinine, and so on. And so some of these features may be, deserve special attention and can guide clinical decision-making. And then again, we found that there was no significant associations between these top features within patients that had the in-hospital cardiac arrests. And then just to acknowledge the team that I've been working with, as well as the institutions, and that's it. Thank you, if you have any questions. Thank you, that's a great presentation. Can we go to the slide that has uh, the data that you, the results that are comparing with the national one? I think it is the third slide probably. Which one, sorry? The one before, oh. I think one or two before. Yeah, right here. So here uh, you had, uh, your data was around 1,400 patients and 60, feature, 60 plus features covered. Uh, now when we look at the performance compared with the national early warning site, do we, did you have the data about how many patients they have to conclude the AUC of 0.79 and how many features they had uh, used to provide that data? Because you're looking at the results from 1,400 patients 
test to a national average. What's the comparison parameter there? So you can assign the national early warning score is based on I think six different clinical features like blood pressure, respiratory rate, and so on. And so you can cal calculate a score, and I think a score of six or greater indicates like in acute condition that the patients would require like immediate follow up. And so it's, it's, it's just calculated based on some of these clinical variables. Great, but you had 1,400 patients. Mm -hmm. How many patients they are using to come to 0.79? Because sometimes when we compare a, an experiment, outcome of an experiment with a general available results, sometimes the, the underlying data comparison also should be presented. So did you compare that? So, Oh we're going to have to move on, but he can, can y'all can connect afterwards, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Shireen Nilazada. Um, she is an associate professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Texas at Arlington. She received her PhD in security informatics from the Indiana University at Bloomington. Her, for her dissertation on privacy-aware decentralized architectures for socially networked systems, she received a two-year fellowship from the School of Informatics and Computing at IUB. Following her doctorate, she held postdoc positions in CNETs at IUB from 2014 to 2015, in SecLab at the University of California, Santa Barbara until 2017, and then at SciLab at Carnegie Mellon from 2017 to 2018. Her research focuses on security and privacy in the context of systems and social networks using techniques from machine learning and big data analytics. Please join me in welcoming. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, thank you very much. How this works? Oh, this one. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the warm introduction. Um, I didn't know they're gonna read everything, so. Um, so I'm here to present our project on how toxic content on social media affects user behavior. And this is a project mainly done by my PhD student, Anna Alexandrik. She was here in the morning, she presented a talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sure many of you spend some hours on social media every day. Um, uh, studies show actually that US um, citizens spend um, more than two hours per day on social media. And they do it mainly to connect to people, to share their thoughts, and it has benefits for them. They enjoy doing it. But at the same time on social media, offensive language, trolling, and hate speech is so prevalent. And this is done uh, to attack and silence people, ideas, and facts. This being a very big challenge for big uh, social media platforms to actually detect and moderate such content. And they've been working on it. They've been spending so much money and effort on this, and still this is a big challenge. As you see, there is a still a lot of uh, toxic content that is prevalent on these websites. Um, some recent um, studies try to um, understand how online toxicity can have negative effects on people's psychological states and well-being. And they have shown that victims actually sh uh, are prone to self-harming uh, behavior and uh, as well as um, uh, depression and anxiety. But there is no study to show how uh, social media users react to this toxic content, and if we can use such uh, information to develop more effective detection um, algorithms and also intervention algorithms. So in this study, we try to understand if users seeing some uh, toxic content on their own posts, will they start avoid further encounters by removing their uh, posts or trying to even deactivate their accounts so they are so harmed that they just try to leave the situation? Or do they tend to engage in the conversations perhaps to pursue people or um, try to even take a revenge and respond in a toxic way? 
Um, in doing this study, we actually um, investigate the impact of other factors such as online visibility and um, identifiability on these reactions. Um, in our analysis, we collected a random sample of tweet conversations. This is the first study that does this. And we also identified conversations with and without toxic um, replies. So we have two data sets, one with conversations with toxic replies and one without toxic replies. And then we collect longitudinal data on users' online behavior for more than one month. And we then finally statistically analyze and compare the user's online behavior in these two data sets. Um, they, we saw actually very interesting results. I only present some of them here. We saw that victims are more likely to remove comments on their posts compared to people who are not receiving any toxic replies. Also, we saw that victims are more likely to engage in these conversations, which is interesting. But um, more interesting, victims are more likely to respond back in a toxic uh, way. So compared to people who are not receiving uh, toxic comments, they uh, tend to reply in a toxic way. We also examine if victims uh, delete uh, their own posts or deactivate their accounts or change the uh, settings of their profiles to private, but we didn't see any um, uh, statistically different um, behavior compared to people who are not receiving hate or uh, toxic content. But uh, still we see that a small percentage of people actually do that. So our main findings are we found that toxicity has an impact on users' online behavior. However, not everyone reacts equally. Um, some uh, show more defensive or aggressive behaviors than others. We also observed that online visibility and identifiability have an impact on users' reactions. I didn't go into details of it, but it, for example, verified accounts are less likely to remove their posts or comments or engage in toxic conversations, which is something we expected because someone who is verified, they don't care about people talking bad about them or uh, they might even like it. Um, some, we also saw that less identifiable accounts are more likely to engage in conversations in a toxic way, which is also expected because usually anonymity is associated with toxicity, online toxicity. Uh, with that, I want to conclude my talk and thanks for listening and I'm open to take your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, uh, I know that probably you use uh, natural language processing, but when you are defining toxicity, uh, how do you, based on the words or phrases, how do you do that? So that's a very good question. We used um, an API provided by Google. They have a um, perspective API where they actually try, this is based on natural language processing, uh, deep learning, trying to detect if something is hateful or not, or severe toxicity, we call it. Uh, they provide a score, and we consider those as scores in our analysis. Right. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. okay. We are on our last lightning talk, and I don't know about you, the variety um, is amazing, and they would have all been, you know, definitely could have gone a lot longer, but time limited, so. Um, our last speaker for this is Paul Murdoch. Paul is currently a medical student at the TCU School of Medicine in Fort Worth. He has a Master's of Science from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Applied Health Sciences Informatics. He is a graduate from the University of Cincinnati where he received a Bachelor of Science in Medical Sciences and a minor in Psychology. He plans to use his degrees to become a physician science, scientist, and Paul also strives to become a well-rounded learner, researcher, and citizen while in medical school. Please join me in welcoming Paul. Thank you. See if I can get these pulled up. I 
have them on the computer. Okay, here we go. So these are some of my learning objectives, yes, thank you. Um, so to recognize VR as a tool in medical education, um, highlight the potential of virtual reality for visualizing human anatomy to provide surgical education, um, understand patient education as a vital component of patient care, and lastly, to demonstrate the need for improved technology access, especially to those of low income. Um, so just a little bit of background. I know many of us in this room have probably used virtual reality before, um, but it's a computer-generated environment containing scenes and objects that appear real. Um, VR growth in healthcare is projected to continue and will likely double in the near future, uh, according to multiple sources. There have been limited studies supporting virtual reality for patient education. Um, most existing literature focuses on providers or students. Um, we plan to use VR to educate patients and improve, uh, improve care delivery by supporting uh, patient education. So this is uh, an example of the tool that we're using. Uh, currently, it's provided by the TCU School of Medicine, and it's used for the medical students. Um, but we're hoping to essentially borrow the, um, uh, the tool. It's a Microsoft HoloLens um, in order to educate uh, patients specifically on cerebral angiograms. Um, so this is an example of, uh, the, the tool was developed by Case Western, so this is an example of medical students using that tool. Um, the methodology, so all of our study participants will be patients of Dr. Oy, um, who is a neurosurgeon at Texas Health in Fort Worth, and uh, all patients initially will be in need of a cerebral angiogram. Uh, first, patients will be provided with a survey that assesses their understanding of the procedure they're going to undergo. Um, next, the patient will be given a hollow lens and will be walked through uh, the hollow anatomy software um, along with a PowerPoint deck to explain how the procedure is performed. And then lastly, the patient will be, provide, will be provided with the same survey at the end that they took beforehand and then pre and post results uh, will be compared uh, to see if their understanding improved. This is an example from that patient PowerPoint deck. Um, it essentially tries to explain in layman's terms, you know, some of the scientific uh, topics that we're trying to discuss. So for example, what an aneurysm is. Um, this next slide is an example of a hollow anatomy slide that we've developed. It doesn't look three-dimensional here because it's in a PowerPoint deck, um, but on the actual hollow anatomy, it'll look like those previous slides did. And uh, this is essentially showing the femoral artery as one of the entry routes and then going up to the brain um, in order to do that uh, angiogram. This is an example of the patient survey that we'll be giving them. Um, and then they'll be using, they'll rate their agreement on a scale of one to five um, using the uh, uh, Likert scale. And these are an example of some of the questions. I know it might be hard to read, but it's essentially asking questions of whether or not they understand the procedure, whether or not they can explain it to family members, uh, so on and so forth. And then they rate it from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, our sample size will, uh, initially will be small, so it doesn't afford us enough power to do a t-test. We're looking to recruit about 20 patients over the next year. Um, patients, again, will rate their agreement. Uh, the pre and post surveys results will be compared, um, and our project essentially will serve as a proof of principle study to assess whether the HoloLens is feasible and effective as a method for providing patient education, and if successful, we hope to expand um, and use this tool to impact patient uh, education and advocate for the use of VR and, and other clinical scenarios. Um, these are some of my references. Any questions? Hi. Right. So from what I understand, uh, the HoloLens is an AR device, an augmented reality device. So are you using uh, virtual reality or augmented reality for yeah, this? Yeah, no, it's, it's technically augmented reality. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. That's a nice project. So uh, have you considered randomizing patients instead of using a pre-post design where you're assessing survey before they see the uh, virtual reality or augmented reality and after. One other consideration could be randomizing patients where half the patients get one modality, half the patients get another, and you're randomly picking it uh, to um, compare if their understanding was better. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's a good point, and I think down the road we'll likely do something like that. We just wanted the, for the initial collection of the results to do that method, but that's a, that's a good point, thank you. 
Can we do a last one, last question over here to your left here? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. And just going to the workflow when you're trying to implement this tool, is this you're trying to do it like on a separate time when they got, the, let's say, when the patient got the information to get an angio? Or is it going to be when they, Dr. Dr. Hoy, put an order and they're going to go and see in a LinkedIn reality environment when, my question is, is the questions might arise by when they have the neurosurgeon there, they can explain it at the right time, different that they have to come and then do you have like more or less uh, more rapport at the beginning compared mm -hmm. to like days or weeks after? Yeah, so it'll be at their regularly scheduled doctor's appointments. It'll be at their pre-surgical visits. So they'll have already met with Dr. Oi uh, beforehand. So uh, yeah, so I understand what you're saying like with the relationship there, um, but it'll be at their regularly scheduled doctor appointments if they choose to enroll. So do you mean the primary care or the, the neurosurgeon is going to be still available or is it going to be an NP for the follow-up appointment? Is it going to be the, a neurosurgeon, the primary care or an the, the, Yeah, the surgeon will be there walking them through using the tool. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Okay. That's it for our lightning talks. Thank you very much to all our speakers. And I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Christopher Lehman. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Fenton. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce again to you our keynote speaker for this afternoon. I've known Dr. Shortliff for a long time. Uh, you know, the first. Um, uh, meaningful interactions I've had when he was the president and CEO of the American Medical Informatics Association. Uh, Dr. Shortliff is an extremely well-known entity in informatics in this country and uh, internationally. Uh, we, have, we were very fortunate to win him to come and uh, speak to us today. Uh, and uh, it is, um, I made the observation not too long ago that uh, among the who's of who, who is who in informatics, there's a good likelihood that they're trained under Dr. Shortliff either at Columbia or at Stanford. So uh, um, he has influenced our field tremendously. Uh, Dr. Shortliff is the Chair Emeritus and Adjunct Professor at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Columbia University. He also has, holds currently adjunct professor appointments in biomedical informatics at uh, uh, the College of Health Solution at Arizona State and at uh, Population Health Sciences at Well Cornell Medical College. So uh, without further ado, I will ask Dr. Uh, Shortliff to uh, come to the stage and talk to us about the evolution of AI in medicine, how the past informs the future. Thanks very much, Chris, and all of you for sticking with us till the end of the day. Uh, I realize there's a reception afterwards, so that also draws you here, I'm sure. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to uh, spend some time with you. It, it turns out that I've been thinking a lot about the general issues that have been raised uh, already at this meeting and uh, uh, in the panel that we had before. Um, and, and because AI has become such a hot topic recently, I think there's sometimes the impression that it just kind of appeared from, from nowhere, and here it is suddenly. But for some of us who've been working in this area for a long time, uh, it's, it's far from new. And I want to give you a sense of kind of where we are right now in a trajectory that began actually many years ago. So, uh, I would say that uh, the state of the art today in medical AI, which is what I'll focus on, 
is really part of a, of a trajectory that began about 50 years ago, AI maybe a decade before that. Um, provide you with some advice. Uh, if you are, as many of you are, among the biomedical AI researchers and implementers that are drawing on the experience that brought us to where we are today and, and try to just give you a sense of where that evolution is going and where we might anticipate would be the big issues uh, going forward based upon that, that set of issues. Uh, it's a big topic for an hour talk and uh, I'll, I'm going to have to skip around a little bit and leave out a lot of detail. Um, but I thought the obvious thing to do was start at the very beginning, which is when the field was first named. Uh, you could argue it started a little earlier if you're a student of Alan Turing and his work, but the, the phrase artificial intelligence was coined for a meeting that was held at Dartmouth uh, College in 1956. And this fellow on the left, John McCarthy, uh, came up with this name for a field uh, that was of intriguing computer scientists who wondered to what extent they could get computers to simulate what human beings do when they solve problems uh, uh, mentally. Now, there have been some efforts subsequently to adjust the name of this field. They've all failed. And, and as I think I indicated earlier, I don't think we're going to call it something else. It's AI is here to stay, sort of. But it does have certain problems uh, in that it conjures up fear factors in some people about the notion that this is all about computers taking over the earth or something. And it's really just a branch of computer science, OK? And now, what about machine learning? Is that brand new? No. <laughs> in about 1959, the fellow on the right here, Art Samuel, who was a researcher with IBM uh, Research, he decided he was going to try to write a computer program that could play checkers. Okay. I know we think of chess as being the big challenge, but in those days, just getting it to play checkers would have been uh, challenging. And he knew the rules of checkers, and he wrote a program that he could play checkers with. But he quickly realized that he didn't know enough about checkers to make it really, really highly competent at playing checkers, that there really is strategy to checkers and the like. And so um, he said, you know what I could do? I've got these scoring functions for various board positions and the like, and they're the best I could come up with, and I know the rules and all that, but what if I actually took my program and put it on two computers that played each other at the game of checkers. And because each of them knew the rules, uh, they could make their own adjustments. Uh, I, I, would, I would write the software so that it would adjust the scoring function for the various board positions. And they can just play like crazy, and I can go do something else and see what happens. And that's what, that's what the, he did. Uh, of course, he had access to amazing computers at IBM Research that would probably be less powerful than your Apple Watch today, but at the time, uh, it worked well. And uh, he let this play, and, and not only did the, the program essentially teach itself to become a superb player by just playing so many games against itself on the other computer, but nobody could beat it after that. Even the world checker champions uh, could not. And it's the basic idea of, of machine learning today, isn't it? Really, you know, you're training it and you've got some scoring functions and they need to be evolved appropriately. So machine learning isn't new, AI isn't new, and we can date both probably to the 1950s as when they really got started. And by the 1960s, there were really three major centers. They all happened to be in the United States. This field definitely started in the US. Uh, I'll mention a little bit about the rest of the world in my talk, but uh, it's, it was very much an American invention. And the three centers, uh, when I first got familiar with this field, were clearly Carnegie Mellon University, which actually was Carnegie Tech until it evolved into becoming Carnegie Mellon uh, in the late 60s. Uh, MIT and Stanford. Now, John McCarthy had been at MIT, but by the 1960s he had moved and was a computer scientist that was the AI guy at Stanford. 
uh, at MIT, Marvin Minsky, a name you might know, and then two giants uh, who uh, essentially partnered to become the major AI figures at Carnegie Mellon, Herb Simon and Alan Newell. Herb Simon was an economist, psychologist. He won the Nobel Prize in economics uh, sometime later. Uh, Alan Newell was a uh, uh, psychologist and human problem solving person who got interested in computation and how it could be used to try to capture some of what he knew as a psychologist. Um, so those three centers were kind of attracting all the young people that wanted to get involved in AI. Uh, and there's an, a marvelous book you can still read and learn a lot from by Marvin Minsky, which is a collection of the PhD dissertations of his first batch of AI students in the 1960s. It's called Semantic Information Processing, uh, the book is. <clears throat> so in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of work going on in AI. Uh, always on mainframe computers, that's all we had then. Uh, but the topics are very similar to what you would see people are working on today. They were people working on machine learning, indeed, and neural networks, which was <clears throat> a model for how that machine learning might work. Natural language processing and, and even speech understanding. I mean, it was inconceivable we'd have the Siri and Alexa of today, but they exist because of work that was done uh, during that era to try to uh, understand how to process signals that were speech and then to interpret them as language. Uh, and then the simulation of human problem solving, general problem solvers, uh, logic systems that were implemented in computers. And then uh, the, the field of biomedicine caught on and became a, a very rich area for this kind of research in the late 60s and 1970s. Uh, this was the emergence of a so-called notion of knowledge-based systems uh, that would take the knowledge of experts and apply them to um, biomedical problems. So what's the first system of this sort? Uh, I, I write about it in a couple of books that I'm not going to be able to go into more detail, but this is a, year, this is a freely available yearbook of uh, medical informatics paper from a couple of years ago that goes into this early history and how the field evolved and where we are today and how much of what today is hype and how much is clearly promising. Um, so I can refer you to that for a lot more detail than I'm going to get into today. And in about two weeks, our new textbook of uh, artificial intelligence in, in medicine is coming out. Uh, and I've just tried to encapsulate on this slide the 20 chapters and the topics that we've tried to cover. And if, uh, if you're interested, you can go to that URL at the top, which tells, shows you who all the authors are and, and, and uh, see who's been involved in this project. And I would point out that chapter two is uh, uh, an entire chapter in the book on the history of the field and how it got to where it is today. So there's a lot more detail there than I can get into today. So the first project uh, almost certainly was the Dendral project. This was in the area of organic chemistry, so it's not quite clinical medicine, but it certainly was life science oriented. <clears throat> and these are the four people who started this project and it began to mature by the late 1960s. Um, now, in, in their day, these were all very famous people. Joshua Letterberg, also a Nobel laureate uh, in medicine and physiology, is a geneticist. He went on to be president of Rockefeller University after he left Stanford, but he was the chair of genetics, the first chair of genetics. He won the Nobel Prize at age 33, which isn't a bad accomplishment. All of you who are over 33, sorry, some have beat you. Uh, Carl Gerasi, a chemist, organic chemist, famous for having uh, participated in the invention of uh, uh, birth control pills, and so he was into uh, the uh, hormonal, uh, hormone chemistry. Computer science from Carnegie Tech, uh, Carnegie Mellon, Ed Feigenbaum, who was recruited to be one of the young faculty in those days. These pictures, by the way, are not from the 1960s. Uh, <laughs> They're the ones I could find. They, they looked a little younger in the 1960s. Uh, 
so he was the computer scientist uh, who uh, became one of the leaders of AI, uh, uh, very well known to this day, still alive. He's the first two are now passed away. And then my closest uh, mentor and associate was Bruce Buchanan. Bruce uh, was a philosopher of science who got interested in computation, recruited to Stanford, and he ended up working on some life science machine learning that I'll describe. So what was the Dendral project exactly? Well, there's a, here's a book about it that, that they put together. <clears throat> the basic idea was to study hypothesis formation uh, and discovery in science, generically, but specifically to try to understand how organic chemists who are well trained in mass spectroscopy could take a chemical formula and a mass spectrum and figure out the structure that uh, corresponded to the chemical formula in organic chemistry specifically, so carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Um, and they did so by basically picking the brain of uh, of Carl Gerasi, trying to understand how he did that task, and then they recruited others who knew how to interpret mass spectra. These are just lines. I don't know if you've seen a mass spectra, but I mean, it's, it's obviously a highly complicated scientific problem. And they got as much as they could and got rather good performance out of the heads of people that they were working with and the programming that went on with it. They encoded much of it in the form of rules, production rules. Uh, that means they were not, these are not mathematical formulas. These were an attempt to capture the semantics of the domain as described to them by these chemists. And then uh, what Bruce Buchanan worked on in particular was so-called metadendral, which was, you know, maybe now that we have a lot of known structures that correspond to known spectra, maybe we can infer rules uh, by looking at these test cases and and, uh, uh, and actually add to our rule set. So that's what Metadendral was about. So this program had a huge impact. It was underway when I first arrived as a med student and grad student at Stanford myself. Learned a lot about it, started working with Bruce. Uh, and so that's how I got into this field. Uh, Ed Feigenbaum uh, is uh, often credited with coming up with the uh, aphorism that knowledge is power. <clears throat> And this little quotation from a talk that he gave in, in the mid-70s uh, basically says, the real power uh, is the knowledge that you manage to encode in a computer program using symbolic, not numerical uh, forms, typically. Um, and that's more important than whatever kind of reasoning method you're using. It's that knowledge itself that provides the power. And this became basically the mantra for much of AI for a long time there, many years. Now in the medical world, uh, many of us said, boy, if we could just come up with AI systems that could be shown to function as well as experts did, they would be accepted. And I hope I'm going to convince you by the end of this hour that there's no way that that turned out to be true, okay? And, and I'll try to explain why it's not. But it's certainly a necessary precondition, okay? These systems tended to be called expert systems because they were trying to simulate what experts did. Here's an artificial intelligence textbook <clears throat> that I grabbed the de definition of AI from in about 1982, okay? And I think it would be interesting to ask yourself, does this sound like the definition that would be used today for artificial intelligence. The study of ideas that enable computers to do the things that make human beings seem intelligent, yeah, that's probably what we mean by AI today. But then look at this other part. That means the ability to reason symbolically, to acquire and then apply knowledge, and to manipulate it and to communicate ideas. And, and so by the 1980s, that's what AI was. That's, this is not a medical book. This is the AI textbook by Patrick Winston from uh, MIT that def defined it that way. And as these expert systems began to get more and more attention, including in the lay press, <clears throat> companies started to get very interested in how they should be using this expert system technology uh, for their own strategic purposes. Uh, and uh, 
you know, but the very, it was becoming a worldwide phenomenon. We were seeing AI groups formed in computer science departments and schools all, all over the place, Asia, Europe, certainly the Europeans held their first AIME, Artificial Intelligence in Medicine Europe meeting in the early 1980s in, in Amsterdam. There were lots of cover stories in, you know, Time and Newsweek and, and, and similar magazines at the time and companies were investing quite a bit of money in creating AI groups within their corporations to, to try to explore how they might use these in their firms. Well, you know what happened, I guess. Many of you have probably heard of this at least. It was totally oversold. People were assuming way too much of what could happen quickly. Um, so by the 1980s and 90s, there was this phenomenon of, of perceived overselling Frankly, not so much by the people actually doing the work, but by the folks who were just fascinated by it and the name artificial intelligence and the concept of computers becoming smarter and smarter and, and the like. Um, and so AI researchers began to say, we better not call what we're doing AI anymore because we'll never get funding <laughs> if we do that. <laughs> And it's true that there was a drop off in funding as this went on. It became known as AI winter. There actually were two AI winters, one of which didn't really affect medicine, but the second one definitely did. Uh, and this gives you a sense of the timing. Uh, the first AI winter uh, was after a kind of peak that occurred in the 1970s. Uh, and around 1980, uh, there was beginning to be dis disaffection with the field. Um, but that was as expert systems were beginning to take off. So there was this sudden increase again after 1980, and that was all the, the medical stuff largely, because that's where a lot of this expert system work started. Uh, but as I impl have implied, that too then had a turnaround around 1987 to 93. That was what we, even in medicine, we remember as AI winter, and you began to see people doing AI research using terms like, let's not call it knowledge representation anymore, let's call it ontology development, okay? And let's not call it machine learning anymore, let's call it knowledge discovery and databases, KDD, okay? And anybody who's in computer science will remember those terms being uh, in vogue at the time, but it was largely a reaction to the fact that you couldn't get any funding or really get, therefore, do solid research if you said you were an AI researcher. But the world was still fascinated by computers. I mean, these are a couple of uh, magazine covers from the 1990s. Uh, and the, uh, I don't know, Bill Gates, I don't know if he was really pushing medicine, but the one on the left, uh, that if you can read the small print, on this cover, it's all about medical things that are coming and how medicine's going to change because of technology and its digitization. Um, and the medical part was very explicit over the next decade. I mean, these are a couple of covers, Newsweek and Business Week, where the notion that computers had a big role to play in medicine, uh, with AI not emphasized, but part of the discussion uh, was very common by that. Remember, there were now getting to be large numbers of people working in informatics, AI, and the like. And it, but let me also remind you that we really didn't have anything but mainframe computers until about 1980, when the first PCs were introduced. And they were very small machines for the kind of work that was required. It was the big workstations that began to get introduced in the late 80s and the 1990s that suddenly allowed you to be freed from running on great big uh, uh, co timeshare computers. So these were Sun, Sun workstations, Sun microsystems workstations, and that kind of thing. And I'm telling you that because it's really important to understand how the evolution of the actual technology has permitted ideas that were kind of untenable in 1970, although they were very promising, to finally begin to see their way to fruition. And that is totally the reason that machine learning is finally here today, okay? The, the, the ideas kind of existed, they've evolved, uh, but the computation just wasn't there, the computational power that was necessary to do what they do. Uh, perhaps the best example of what happened is thinking about EHRs and the sudden recognition of what you could do with all those data. 
and the fact that we were actually beginning to try to find ways to share data that would allow us to have huge data sets, not even single institutional data sets anymore. Uh, and it wasn't just EHR data, you know, lab test results, it was things like images, you know, the x-ray files from multiple hospitals and de-identified and combined, but the labeled with the actual diagnosis and, and uh, imaging became one of the real movers that began to push people to think that machine learning really maybe could now work, that we had the power in machines. And then, uh, although there was a lot of work already underway, the discovery of the deep neural net approaches that we call deep learning today. I've mentioned in particular Hinton and his colleagues. He was at the University of Toronto and then later at Google. But the deep learning is what really had revolutionized the uh, image processing end of, of this spectrum, right? But it was dependent on the technology, not just, not just new algorithmic approaches. So I'm gonna now, Change, uh, change tone here a little bit and begin to think, let's think about clinical decision support. Uh, partly because an awful lot of what we're looking at in AI these days is clinical decision support. I view AI as a major approach to clinical decision support now, but for many years there were, there were other approaches, uh, simple algorithms of various sorts, rule sets and things like that that weren't particularly AI. Um, and let's start with this imaging part because I think it's an important example of, of where this has really had an impact and been successful. And we heard about it from our colleague, the radiologist, in the earlier panel. <clears throat> well, what's the point about this kind, what I would call device data interpretation? Well, it's a world in which there are some kind of decision specific clinical data from some kind of device that measures something in the human body, and the software then produces a report. It interprets it, right? And it sends the report to the clinician. And examples are electrocardiograms, electroencephalograms, all kinds of x-ray images, MRI, CTs, regular plain films, uh, microscopic images, pathology, hematology, dermatology, photographs, these are all images that where you can generate a report that tells you what the computer has determined using these deep learning methods perhaps uh, is the explanation for any abnormality or that it's normal. So the clinician can verify the interpretation by looking at the data. Look at the picture. Right? Look at the tracing. And if the, if the clinician or, or an expert in the field has the expertise to interpret that same image or that same tracing, they can kind of decide if it, if it looks reasonable what the computer has, has said to them. Okay. So this, this is pretty well accepted, this approach to applying AI today. It, and I'm gonna explain why other approaches are not, or other uh, kinds of applications are not. Uh, when I was a med student, this is the way I would get a 12-weight EKG. I don't know if you noticed, but up there in the right-hand corner is the interpretation of the EKG. Okay? But I could look at the EKG, too, and I could then look at the interpretation. I could decide. Maybe as a medical student, I might ask somebody, but, you know, a cardiologist or, or a, a highly experienced ex, uh, electrocardiographer, could, could look at that and, and make a decision whether or not it made sense. This was not AI, by the way. These were Fourier transform signal analysis programs, but they were built into the machines, right? Interesting to ask the question what kind of regulation there was about <laughs> the software that produced those interpretations in the context of our earlier discussion. I don't know. I mean, these, these were devices that happened to do interpretation too, so very interesting. Leap ahead to the late previous decade, and we start to see these deep learning programs doing things that are very similar, okay? This is this, this early uh, paper that came out about uh, uh, 
interpretation of diabetic retinopathy on the images, uh, vi visual images, uh, excuse me, retinal images, uh, with great accuracy as, as compared to what experts interpreted them to be. All right, so there's those kind of applications. Then there's another set that I wouldn't even call AI, but because we're talking more generically about decision support, I think they're important to consider here. And those are monitoring uh, alerts that have become a big part of order entry systems and, and EHRs, right? So here, you've got a repository, finally, in the, in the more modern world of real data on patients in electronic form. <clears throat> and you could, of course, therefore, allow physicians to look at those data, and we've done that for some decades now uh, through various interfaces, first in hospital information systems and eventually in true EHR systems. And also allow them to, to enter orders of various sorts through those same interfaces. Um, so the doc interacts with an interface that gets him or her access to the repository. And then you can write software that monitors what's going on in that database for various events of interest. That's why it's called the event monitoring software, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes it notices something. Now, how does it notice anything? Well, because it has some rules, a knowledge base of what you should be watching for in the database. And if you see that one of those rules applies to this patient at some time, real time, as data are pouring into their record, <clears throat> you may want to send them a warning or an alert. Hey, you're trying to order an antibiotic to which the patient is allergic, uh, or simple stuff like that, right? Um, and sometimes it was written in the form of rules. There's a whole syntax that was developed for these kind of rules, the so-called Arden syntax. Um, if a patient's receiving DIG and the serum potassium is low, you might want to warn the clinician that they need to get potassium replaced. Okay. So these are now kind of standard issue. There's a lot of question about their effectiveness. There are studies that show that a lot of times doctors ignore these warnings and alerts that they get from such systems. But we won't go into that anymore, because that, I'm going to reuse that picture in a second. That's all. So I need to show you that picture. Okay? So the third is what I've always been interested in and has been the major challenge, and kind of was an implied part of much of what we were talking about earlier in the panel, and that is direct interaction of some sort between a computer and a clinician in which decision support is being offered by the computer to the physician or the clinician. Well, in the old days, we would start with a clinical advisory tool uh, that we would write, like our early expert systems, <clears throat> that was uh, usually dealing with diagnosis or treatment. And we'd use some analytic method for uh, helping with the diagnosis or treatment. And it might be rules, or it might be a scoring function of various sorts. It might be purely statistical. That lots of different approaches have been used for clinical decision support. And you'd have a clinician interacting with that system and getting advice back, right? Well, that was the picture I might have drawn in 1976. The only problem was it took a long time to enter a case into one of these programs. Even if the program performed pretty well, you're in a busy clinic, you know. And, and, and as soon as we started to have clinical databases appearing in, in the same environments, the, the, the clinicians would quite logically say, why am I answering this question? Go look it up in the computer. You know, I don't need to tell you the creatinine, right? So this is why I want to use the previous picture. You've got a repository for clinical information, and it may well be able to answer some of the questions that this kind of a clinical decision support system uh, would like to use. And you, you know, you saw this picture before. So maybe the best way to reach the clinician with the results of this kind of advisory tool is to make it part of the interface to the record that they're using anyway, rather than a separate stop, if you will, 
just to get a consultation from a computer. So integrated into the information flow. Right. Well, sounds good. This, 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 this model up at the top had became known as the Greek Oracle model. Okay. Oh, I need some help. I'm going to go to the, uh, the Oracle and ask a question and get an answer, and then I'll take it back to where I go. Well, it was the only reasonable way to do it before we had networking and integrated systems, but it was never going to be a very viable way to get clinicians to use these kinds of tools. But this one is the preferred model. Let's make it part of what they're doing anyway, blend it in, and try to make it be so helpful that if it takes a few minutes longer, it's worth it. So is this easy? There are a whole bunch of issues, and I'm going to talk quickly about these issues, okay? This is based on a, well, it's not based on it. I had the ideas already. We wrote it up in a little viewpoint article in JAMA a couple years ago that may be of interest to you, and it basically said um, there are some things you need to consider beyond performance, decision-making performance, if you want to have a successful program. Clinical decision support in the era of artificial intelligence. I wrote it with a, a friend who had been working on this stuff with me. Here's a phrase that I heard used earlier today. In this context, where the physician is interacting with the computer and getting advice, I still believe they're going to almost always want an explanation. Not take it or leave it. And this is one of the big challenges with some of the more statistically oriented approaches is they can't give you anything other than numbers or, uh, let's face it, if you've got a deep learning model and the best explanation they can come up with is there are these three nodes in this multi-layered neural net that have really lit up on this case. So take your patient to the ER, uh, to the OR. No, no, that's not going to work, is it? So this business of explainability, I think, is huge. We, we, we referred to it briefly. Uh, and I'm going to come back to one of the ways I think it can be tackled more effectively. Second is time. This issue of workflow has suddenly become a major focus in the design of most systems. How much is it going to interrupt? what you have to do, and you're always under time pressure, right? If it slows you down hugely, you're not going to use it. That's just unfortunately true. If it's, if it's really complex and not very usable, and you can't figure out the interface, or it takes you 15 clicks to get down to the point where you want to actually see something. You won't use it, right? So this usability issue, which I think is being terribly ignored by many of the companies, including the major EHR companies. And the reality is we know that users will vote with their feet, okay? No matter what you want them to do, they're going to do what makes sense to them, right? Yeah. So there's a big whole psychological and cognitive theory of what you have to do to get this right. Okay? And that's why I say it's not just decision-making performance that matters. It's all these other issues that are crucial to the process. Relevance and insight. These are really essential. You, you, don't, you lose faith quickly in a computer program that you're using if it obviously suddenly says something that makes no sense, even if it's otherwise been going along pretty well. Uh, I'm sure that the men in the room can all relate to how annoying it is to being asked in the middle of a questionnaire whether you happen to be pregnant when you've already identified yourself as a male just seems like this program is out of touch with reality. You know, somebody forgot to tell them the obvious stuff. You know. 
by the way, that, these comments were not meant in any way to fail to recognize issues of gender identity. Okay. <laughs> I just think most of the time, or much of the time, that that's, that just drives you crazy. Uh, I, here's an example I've been using for years, okay? Anybody in the audience fail to get the diagnosis for this patient's problems? You're seeing the doctor? Rapid pulse, sweating, shallow breathing, according to the computer, you've got gallstones. <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is a silly example, but, but you get my point. Is that it needs to seem to really understand the same world you're living in. It has to be respectful. We're trying to build programs for people that have been like in school for most of their lives, right? And if you treat them like they're dumb or they can be simply replaced, you're sending the wrong message. When, when this AI in medicine first got going, AI Magazine from the AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, put this on the cover. Just kind of reflect the fears out there about what we were talking about earlier, ro robots kind of taking over and the human touch being lost. Okay? And, and we all know that's not the goal of this work. <clears throat> so we, we have to stop putting the stethoscope on the computer screen. Right? And I, I, you know, Chuck Friedman a few years ago really made this point very well. He said, what, what we're really doing in this field is trying to say human brains enhanced by well-developed computers can do a better job than the physician without the, without the computer. But we've got to really make sure the computer is well-designed to make that work. And finally, and I'm going to per perseverate on this one for a few minutes, is how do you get these things accepted and integrated into workflow? And you can look at many other fields of medicine and get a pretty good idea of what it takes. Look at, look at the pharmaceuticals that we adopt all the time. Why do we adopt them? Why do clinicians start adopting them? Is it really just the detail man from the pharma companies who comes to the office? Or is there something more? I think actually clinicians, uh, physicians, and other provider groups are very persuaded by good studies and good journals, right? Studies that really convince them that this new drug is, is when well examined, well tested. And, and I mean, yes, the FDA approval might be important too before you start prescribing it. But remember, the FDA itself looks at those studies. So it's those studies, it's what you write, it's how you convince people that you've really been rigorous in the evaluation of the systems. So these are the kind of things you want to demonstrate and then write about, it seems to me, in this area of decision support. Have you demonstrated the quality of the key components? Have you demonstrated the validity of the advice or the interpretation that comes out of the software? Have you demonstrated it's acceptable to users? That means, uh, will they use it? You know, it's possible to use something and have, a, it have no impact at all on how you behave or how you, what decisions you make, right? So you act, if you can show it's acceptable and that they'll use it, you also need to show that it changes what they do under the correct circumstances. It's only logical. And if it does change what they do, so what? What's the impact on the patient? I mean, I, I, all of you, I think, if you think about everything I'm just saying right now, say, oh my God, this is getting really hard. And it is. It's really complicated in our field to do all these things. And they almost have to be done in this order. There's no point in trying to demonstrate an impact on outcome if you've, if you've got something that's unacceptable to users up high, higher up on the, on the list, you know? Then if it doesn't have an impact on outcome, you don't know if it's because it's no good or because they just won't use it. And ultimately, somebody's gonna ask, so is it worth the cost? 
Is it, is it cost effective? And does it apply generically to populations? I didn't write that on here, but it's another important one. I would argue that almost all the, the papers I've seen in our field that look at decision support systems and evaluate them for the journals, including the clinical journals, focus on the first two items here and don't do any of the other four. It's quite an indictment. Why is that true? Oh, it gets much harder than those other four. Okay. There's this stuff in the upper left here, which is the initial work that you can do in a kind of laboratory setting, if you will. You can, you can run you know, thousands of cases through a machine learning program and see how well it does. You can, you know, that, you know, that, that you can do after you've trained the model. That's all work that you can do in a laboratory setting, right? It's that real world stuff that only that is necessary to answer the last four questions. Is it acceptable to users? Well, <laughs> gotta put it out there and see if people use it. And you've got to deal with the challenges of getting an institution to let you use it before you've actually written those papers in some kind of suitable controlled setting. And then can you show that it has an impact on their behavior? And have you, after you've done that, depending a little bit on what the advice area is, it could take a long time to see what the impact on patient outcome is. You know, five-year survivals in cancer, I mean, you know, that's a long study, right? But sometimes you have shorter term outcomes that you can measure that, that can help you get on the, right, on the right track here. And, you know, the lack, of, the lack of this to me means that we're not thinking adequately at the beginning of our projects about what it's going to take to bring it to fruition. Okay. So there's a whole bunch of work you need to do before. This is what I call the definition design phase. You've got to identify the problem, make sure that it hasn't already been solved, see what solutions have been tried. You have to partner with the suitable people that are expert and are likely to be able to provide you with reasonable cases, uh, especially if you're not an expert in the area yourself. And many people that build these kinds of systems aren't, even if they're medically trained, aren't an expert in the specific problem that they're going to work on. You've got to analyze what what is going to need to be done, then you have to motivate people who want to work with you. You got to get them excited. This could be great. That's what you'd like as a reaction, right? And then you have to create the actual plan. Okay. That all is kind of the preparation work. And the implication here is collaboration, 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 lots of collaboration. If you're aiming for a real world result. And then there's the actual project work. Oh, well, you gotta innovate as necessary because almost always you're gonna find that the off-the-shelf solutions don't work for the problem you've identified. Um, you gotta actually build the system and implement it and you've gotta be willing to cycle several times as you see things don't work well and, and the like. This is an iterative process typically. And then finally you have to do the assessments of the sort so if on the previous slide I said the assessment is the end in the naturalistic setting, what's left? That's the science, folks. You need to reflect, you need to communicate what you've done, you need to generalize, ask what did I do here that others might be able to benefit from? Especially methodologically. Is there a new method, a new approach? If I write it up properly, maybe somebody else will be able to pick it up and use it in another field. That is science. That's what scientists do in other disciplines. We don't do it nearly enough in informatics. Okay. So writing for informatics journals ought to always deal with the generalization question, in my opinion. And the more applied stuff goes more into maybe the clinical journals in the areas where you've shown that you have an impact on the clinical problem. So sharing it and inspiring people, that's all part of it. Okay. And that's as important to the project as the first two stages. That, that set of things you need to do at the end. 
That's how people get PhDs. Good ones, anyway. You write it up and you identify what your contribution has been. But we all can keep doing that. So, clinical decision support systems, including commercial products, require a time-consuming staged evaluation. The, the, the companies are not doing what I just described. Maybe it's, it just seems too, mu too much to do. I, you know, you never, never have a product out if you do all this stuff. But it's fundamentally part of what, how you evaluate their product, I think. And it means they have to do something more than just show it makes good decisions. Right? And the people that are the early adopters that you engage uh, in building the system and understanding the expertise that's necessary to do it um, become your partners in evaluation as well. Since lots of questions can't be answered until you put these systems outside the laboratory in actual clinical use environments. Okay, so where are we now? Explosion of interest in AI broadly, and of medical AI in particular. And I, I say medical AI in particular because if you look at the literature, there's about as much on medicine as on any other area, except maybe self-driving cars. <laughs> Real confusion in terms. AI, machine learning, data analytics, and data science are not synonyms but they are all parts of the field that we've come to call biomedical and health informatics, okay. every one of them. And this notion that data science is different from, I mean, we've been doing data science in, B, in BMI as long as I've been in the field. We just called it something new recently, largely because we suddenly have so much more data, you know, big data. But the issues are, the, are, are very familiar. And Machine learning is an area of AI. It's not, we're going to learn about AI and then we're going to go learn about machine. No, they are, you're learning about AI if you learn about machine learning. It's an important part of AI. And as you've probably gathered, I think that deep learning, which is all the, all, all the rage right now, is, in my opinion, too often viewed as a full solution. It doesn't meet those criteria I showed you before, the six criteria, six issues. Certainly the black box, it doesn't. So how do we, what does it know? What, that's why I said, what's the knowledge in a model that comes out of a machine learning program? That's not really what we would normally think of as knowledge. It's not symbolically representable. Right? You can't give a talk on the model itself other than how you created it. And how, it, and how well it performs. And how should we then address the need for explainability? And there, this is the third, the third point here is my main take home lesson. All that work that has been done in the past on knowledge representation, understanding what's in the minds of people, representing it in computers, needs to be merged with what's going on in machine learning. Now, how? Great research project. I would like to see people much more explicitly tackling that problem. And, and for the reasons that I've tried to convey logically here, which is we, we are not gonna be able to get the full benefit of some of these wonderful new methods if we don't take into account the human mind. And of course, we still have a bunch of early challenges that still are around, and they have things like how best to integrate and interoperate, and deal with terminology that doesn't seem to even still be standardized optimally, and who owns the data, and who shares the data, and what's the value of data, and many others like that, right? Those are not new, they're here today, uh, but they have been much discussed for actually decades. So the key lessons for people doing AI in medicine research today, it seems to me, are 
let's not reject that old knowledge is power aphorism. I say, still think there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't throw out what we're doing today, but we look for how we better integrate the old and the new. Incorporate an understanding of how human beings, and especially acknowledged experts, would solve the problem. It's still worth understanding. Recognize the promulgation and acceptance of medical AI solutions will depend on much more than decision making or analytical performance. It's all those other things that I said need to be evaluated, right? And accept that AI projects have to be driven in part by a deep understanding of the biomedical issues. As an editor of a journal, I can tell you I got so many papers from computer science departments that had found a big medical data set and they proved that they could get the right answer using deep learning on that data set. And they had absolutely no understanding of the domain and it came out in the discussion. They didn't work with people from that domain. They just managed to get some data. This is a medical field for people that are exposed to, to medical topics, biomedical topics. And I think we can perceive the future is bright, but we are really still in med, midstream. This is not the end. It's not like this is what AI is. No, I, I mean, who knows what AI will be in another 10 or 20 or 30 years. Right? So those are the, the somewhat preachy talk I wanted to give, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the, if we have a few minutes. We do, I guess. <laughs> um, this was so insightful. Um, we were kind of giggling back here, though, because to your point, we're old enough to remember some of these things. <laughs> but um, could you speak a little bit to, um, and I don't want to call out companies, corporations, but you know, the Blue Jean, the Watsons. I mean, th these are some, and you know, other companies that are not healthcare. They're so have so much access at their fingertips to so many of these tools, but yet they continue to fail. I'm, I don't know if you have any. Th I mean, I'm sure you do have thoughts. I could actually pick it up in here, but I, it may be interesting in context of this for a younger generation to hear some of that. So, I think there is a a very important comparison to be made between um, the way the computing industry relates with academia and the medical computing community relates with academia, okay? Uh, look, Google, Facebook, IBM, all these guys, they, they, they do joint research projects, they fund projects in-house, they do internships, they, they uh, give endowed chairs, they do all kinds of things to try to build ties to academia because they know that their future is in the university, okay? Uh, as it is, and I fully believe, we, we have lots of evidence of that from the big changes that have occurred in the industries over the years. Look at the major companies we think of in the EHR world like, I, I believe that they're very standoffish in relationships with academia. They think they know it all. Look at the way they do usability, not very formal. And it shows in their products, okay? So uh, I think that's one issue in the medical world. There is another issue when a, when a major company, you mentioned the Watsons and the, those kind of guys that, that are from those big companies that have had ties with academia but still have failed in this marketplace. And you know, many of us uh, who have been in the field a while get involved as consultants and advisors and stuff uh, into some of these corporations. And my observation is they naively believe that because they have so much technological know-how, they don't really need to understand the medical domain and they do not draw upon the people that we train in biomedical informatics, okay? Uh, people that really understand both the, the medicine and the, and the real world of hospitals and private practices and, and, and the like and who, uh, and who also have technical technical knowledge 
of, of computing. And in a couple of cases where I've been involved and gone in late as an advisor, I've just been appalled to see all the money that they're spending and, 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 and how great the technology is and how little they understand their, their market and, and their audience, you know? So uh, this ought to, it ought to be right from the beginning in the companies if they really want to get into this. And they should be hiring our graduates much more than they do and realize, you know, they say, well, that guy's great, you know, he went to Stanford Computer Science or Carnegie Mellon, he really knows computing or is a great in machine learning. He can learn the medicine. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It's not part of the psychology that they bring into the job, okay? The passion for a specific impact, in my opinion. You to the point, you know, practitioners should be also equally involved when the research are taken, research oh, are happening in the technology field. Right? I said that. That's you need to have your your collaborations need to start early and continue through the actual testing in the clinical setting. Absolutely, they need they need to be. That's what I said about exciting them and and uh, make them really want to be part of it. We have seen that happen on on university based projects where docs have gotten involved and it's been like the most fun they have in their week is working on those kind of projects. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks again for the talk. That's, that pretty, was incredible. Cool. Oh, I can't hear you. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, incredible history lesson. <laughs> I learned a lot. Uh, I just have a question about the, uh, the so uh, you, you put up several of these um, sort of uh, magazine covers. Uh, and do you, do you worry that maybe the, the expectation set by marketing uh, may press um, may press both maybe physicians or regulators or both uh, to accept this technology before uh, those people would feel comfortable with it. Maybe maybe uh, public pressure. Well, as I, as I tried to imply uh, earlier, I actually believe that the um, the hype that led to the AI winters was largely driven by these magazines and newspapers. Okay, they they just wrote like crazy about it and they yeah. they interviewed a lot of people and, and many of us tried to you know calm them down and put it in realistic terms and right. you know don't over, don't over promise uh, but i do think that the uh, i i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say that was marketing except marketing by the magazines maybe. Right. yeah yeah uh, not by the companies today it's a little different because uh, frankly you notice I, I i drew the the ai hype diagram, just unbridled since the early 1990s. And I get asked often when I show that picture, so are we about ready for another AI winter? <laughs> you know, and it's a reasonable question to ask because there is so much hype going on right now. Yeah. Um, and of course, I don't know for sure, but yeah. my sense is it's, it's different now because we're really delivering in lots of ways, I yeah. mean, including in medicine. So. It, that, uh, I think we may still have some unrealistic expectations about time frame and, and the like, but I'm hopeful that we won't see another desperate plummet. Yeah. Thank you. 